your, your affiliation next to your name in the Zoom. And what we're going to do is because we have so much to get to in today's meeting, I think rather than going around and doing full introductions, we'll just highlight a couple of folks that we have um, joining for the first time who are sitting in the place of committee members, representing committee members who cannot be here. And, um, and then a couple of thank yous. I don't see um, Councilman Clark or Councilwoman Parody here. Are they here? Are either of them here? I know Councilman Hines is here. Uh, Council person elect Peretti is not able to be here today. She has a delegate. So she Great. has a proxy here, um, Zach, I think. Oh, Zach. Okay, perfect. So maybe Zach, we, you can say quick hello. We wanted to just give a formal thank you to Councilman Clark. I don't know if he can be here, but um, he has served on this task force and he's outgoing as a councilman and um, Councilwoman elect Parody is going to be taking his spot. And so Zach, I know you're here to represent her. Maybe you could say a quick hello. Um, Councilman Hines, thank you so much for being here also. But let me just call on a couple of you to say hello who others may not have met, and then we'll launch into the meeting. So um, Zach, do you wanna just say a quick hello? Yeah, uh, hello, uh, glad to be here. Uh, Council member elect Paradier uh, just uh, asked me last minute here to step on the call. Um, but uh, feel free to relay any questions or concerns or anything else, uh, that, and I'll get them back to Sarah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And Brian Loma, I believe you're here for Van. Is that right? Do you want to just say anything about that real quick so folks know? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Brian Loma, um, uh, co-director, Waste No More Denver. I'm the, the guy that led the teams for the signatures and the vote to get us to where uh, we could have all these meetings today. Um, I am actually, yeah, alternate as well. So I'm here in replace of Van, uh, who is recovering well uh, from his uh, ac bicycle accident. He had to have a titanium rod put in his leg and uh, he's on uh, crutches in a cast right now. So we are Not definitely thinking about him. Thank you for being here for him. Absolutely. And I think um, Dan Duard, you're here from Republic Services because Chris Barry is no longer here. Do you want to say a quick hi? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the uh, general manager for the uh, Denver market. So, uh, you know, glad to be on the call and uh, listening to everything as it continues to evolve. Thank you. And I see Andrew Hamrick here from the Apartment Association. Are you you're here for Peggy today, Andrew? Uh, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Drew Hamrick. I'm with the Government Affairs Department of the Apartment Association of Metro Denver, and uh, Peggy Panzer has been our member that's been sitting on the task force thus far, and she's in France. Lucky her. So glad that you're here. Thank you for, for being in her, her, here in her place. Um, is there anyone else who is serving as a proxy or representative for a task force member who I missed? Okay, great. Well, it's wonderful to see everyone here today. And I am, um, I think if it's okay with you all, we are gonna go ahead without uh, further ado and without full introductions, just because we want to jump into the substance of today's meeting. Um, you're welcome to put in the chat if you wanna make sure folks know who you are, why you're joining today, please, please do so. And feel free to send Van well wishes in the chat as well. <laughs> Thanks, Erica, for doing so. Um, Okay, here's the here's the goal for today's meeting before I pass it off to other folks. Um, we are getting to the point in the Waste No More process where we, you all have been coming up with recommendations that will eventually make their way in the form of ordinance language, rules and regs, uh, supplementary policy recommendations to city council uh, to implement Waste No More. And at this point, we have you all have, as work groups um, have developed a number of recommendation proposals. Most of them are somewhat high level. They're not in um, detailed text yet in terms of policy language, but they're in conceptual form. And the goal for today's meeting is to come out of this meeting with agreement and willingness to go forward as a task force with these recommendation concepts 
um, to public input in August, where basically um, the recommendation concepts will be up on the website with an opportunity for public comment. There'll be a number of focus groups and, and, a, and, a, and a meeting that's open to the public, probably online. There'll be a number of your convening outreach meetings with your constituents and just an opportunity to share with people what the task force has been discussing so far and an opportunity for them to get questions answered here, just understand what ha is happening with Waste No More and what to expect and provide any comments. So that's, um, and again, there'll be an extensive public comment period after there's actual recommended actual ordinance language. So this is just a preliminary public outreach period for the task force. Um, so that's what we want to come out of today's meeting with, ideally, and we want you also to know what to expect, and we'll talk a little bit about that one-month public outreach period in August. So um, I think with that, I will just let you know that we've decided to, keep, rather than do small groups and breakout groups at today's meeting, because we're at the point where you all have had the opportunity to um, read the draft recommendations and submit comments and think about it. We just wanna dive in with the whole group into those recommendations. So that will be the bulk of our meeting today, which is why we're going pretty quickly through the introduction part. Um, so I think Blake, you can advance the slides and um, yep. So there's, this is the summary of task force members for those of you who are new and or joining from the public. And then you can keep going, Blake. Um, so we wanted to give you a sense of just a reminder where we are in the process, and then we'll let everyone know what's been happening between June and July to give you context for today's, um, the presentations. So here we are in July. This is the time when you'll hear from the work group that's been working on signage, messaging, and education about the recommendations they've come up with. Hopefully most of you have seen those, so you'll hear from them in the form of their recommendations. But in general, we're, we're gonna be just going through the overall proposals thus far on all the topics. So that's today. And um, you all will have you know, any input that you wanna provide on, on what outreach you are doing with your sectors next month. And then just a reminder, we'll come back in September for a final meeting. If we need to add another one, we can talk about what doing that at that time. Um, but at this point, there's one final meeting planned in September to incorporate all the public input and finalize the recommendations. So Blake, you can go to the next slide. And at this point, I wanna turn to folks who, well, actually, I think you're gonna hear from them in a minute. I think what we'll do is just let you know that the signage and education work group has been meeting. They've come up with recommendations. You'll hear from Nina Waysdorf and maybe other work group members in a few minutes about what they've come up with. Likewise, the C&D work group has, um, has met, has continued to meet, and they've come up with recommendations. Uh, there's a lot that they've been considering. Um, there's an organics group has come together and had a, few, a couple of discussions um, that they can fill you in on as well. And Blake, I'll turn to you to do that whenever, whenever you think is, uh, it makes sense. Um, then there's been a lot of drafting new recommendations. And Grace, you, you might want to say a couple words on the briefing that's, that you all did a couple weeks ago. Oh, just that I hope everybody's had a chance to view it by now. And I heard there was a, a good tip floating around to put it at 1.5 times speed or even two times speed to make it go even faster. But we really appreciated those of you who were able to join that briefing. And then, you know, ideally everybody's watched it. And I think um, that seemed to be a really good strategy to fill people in on progress um, before this meeting. So we all came prepared. And so um, we're considering doing that again. Um, we'd like to get your feedback on how that went. And depending on how that went, if it went well, we'll do it again uh, prior to the September meeting. And, you know, one thing I might suggest is for folks to just put in the chat, those of you, I think most of you, um, the vast majority of you watched or attended that briefing. If you could just put in the chat if you thought it was useful, um, if there's anything that you think would be useful, if if it's done again in September, what would be useful to change? Um, and whether you want a couple minutes to talk about it, that would be great if you'd be willing to put that in the chat. Um, Blake, do you want to say anything at this point about the organics discussions before we move, go on here? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Juggling on a couple balls, um, but uh, 
Yeah, first off, uh, af good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Blake Adams, manager of Zero Waste Circular Economy. Um, we have, uh, yes, we, we hosted two really productive sessions on the topic of organic recycling, one on June 27th and the, uh, the second on uh, July 7th. Um, I think we are, you know, just being pragmatic about the, the, the short time between the last meeting and this, this session, um, we are working on some uh, supporting recommendations, um, but we do not have those prepared today, um, but we will likely be in a position to share those or incorporate those recommendations, most which might have uh, be incorporated into existing recommendations um, within you know, the next couple of days or even a week. Um, and there may be a need to meet another one more time just to finalize those but um, just really want to celebrate all the progress that we've made. I think we've landed in a really good place there. Blake, I'm sorry, if I may add, if I understand correctly from what you've said, um, those recommendations are not germane to the ordinance language, right? They're more akin to the um, supports uh, that are tangential to the recommend or to the ordinance. Is that correct? Yes, so far, the ones that we've identified or the recommendations that we've identified do not directly impact the ordinance language. That's correct. Okay. And if there's time today um, toward the end of the meeting, we can certainly um, see if folks from the organics group that has been talking want to share any highlights from that discussion. So we can certainly come to that and you're welcome to just make a note if, you, um, if you'd like to do that, make a note in the chat. Um, okay. So we just, just on this last bullet, we are gonna be at the end of this meeting turning to, we've been starting a spreadsheet, the city has been starting to keep track on a spreadsheet of the outreach meetings that will be happening in August to let people know about Waste No More, to get people's input on the recommendations at a high level. And so just know that we'll come back to that and, and share that spreadsheet so you can see what's been think, thought about so far and, and add your thoughts to it. Okay, um, so, before we delve into the recommendations themselves, Grace, I think you were going to just remind people all this, the stuff that's going to be happening starting on day one from council passage for that first year. Yes, I just wanted to, I think I wanted, excuse me, <clears throat> to bring back this slide from the last meeting, just because I think that there was a lot happening in that meeting, and I don't know how clear this one was. And also because we are getting a new mayor on Monday and many new council members. And so it's just good to remind ourselves how these city processes work. So this slide is only talking about when you're done. Like once you're done with all your recommendations and our, our process is well wrapped up and you have um, you have sent the, uh, the recommendations to us, we have drafted it into uh, actual ordinance language. We've all gone to city council and supported it and it has passed. Once it's passed, and this is important when we get into the recommendations that talk about compliance dates, um, the compliance dates are further out than the date when city council will, will vote to approve this revised ordinance, but the action begins then. So all of the education and outreach and supports and all the behind the scenes work that we at the city need to do to enable compliance by those first compliance states, all of that goes into action uh, as soon as the council actually approves. So um, the reason why we only have these in months, um, number of months rather than actual months is only because we do need to be respectful of the new council, not knowing exactly when we're gonna put this in front of them. Um, but I think it's important just to note that, I think because I think this has come up, there has been confusion around, you know, well, what happens on that date? You know, on, let's say it's January 1 of 25, if a building doesn't have it's recycling or composting uh, system set up. Is it out of compliance? Yes, by that date, that is the date by which um, everything needs to be in place for all the entities for each of their compliance periods. But there will be a lot of work leading by the city leading up to that point. So no one's going to be caught by surprise. And I think that's the most important uh, takeaway from the content here because I know nobody wants me to read all of these boxes. And this, this has been provided out. We will link it again. Um, in the chat, if that's helpful. Uh, did any, for anyone who has had a chance to review this in advance, does anybody want to ask questions at this time? 
Sonia, looks like your hands up. Yeah, yeah, the only thing I would ask about that compliance date, because I, I agreed with everything you said, and I love the approach to educating before uh, and helping support before starting penalties. Is that enough time? That was the one thing that just struck me is, I know it might seem like a lot, but I will tell you coming from my my members on the restaurant side who are literally understaffed and working like crazy, there are some laws that came into place years ago. I'll give you one example, the pregnancy accommodation law that there, there, I can't tell you how many people are like, what are you talking about? And we advertised that so many times over and over and over that they needed to abide by it. And there are still people that aren't doing it because they just aren't aware of some of these things coming up. It's just hard to get hold of some of these folks. So that was just the one thing that struck me was, are we giving enough education time? Before so we if start. I may, sure, if I may, Sonia, that's actually going to be a major feature of today's discussion. Could I defer that question to when we get to that in this sure. agenda? Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. And we'll note, yeah, we'll note the, the interest and the concern there. Um, great. Is there anyone else who has just a quick question or clarification question or comment about this? Okay. I'm not seeing anyone. And if you do, please um, try to raise your hand in the Zoom because with the screen share, um, it's hard to see people's physical hands. So anyway, thank you. Oh, Scott. Just real quick. I do, I do have a question about um, compliance. And is there going to be any kind of, um, is there going to be any kind of way to take into account that there might not be enough companies out there to compost? I mean, because if you don't have enough companies to compost, you can't be in compliance if you can't find anyone. So yeah, just, and a, you know, just a quick question. Yeah, that's another one. Actually, the, the entire substance of today's discussion is going to be about those details. We just need to get there in the agenda. Okay. So that's where we're going to get you. to that in the recommendations. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, and feel free if you have questions as they come up, feel free also to put them in the chat because we're going to be monitoring that and trying to address them as we go. Um, it does look right. like Brian Loma has a question. So in terms of if folks do want to raise their hand, um, if you go at the bottom of your screen, uh, if your Zoom screen, go to reactions and there you go and press raise hand. That's how you can raise your hand. Brian, did you want to say something quickly before we keep on? Yeah, just uh, as a gentle technical reminder, my understanding is this ordinance is already in effect. So to the earlier question, like, there's nothing stopping businesses or whatever any of anybody from enacting efforts to to follow this now. Yeah, great. And just thanks, Brian. And and just one quick note because it looks like we have both we have task force members and we also have members of the public and uh, on the call. And because we have some of you who are proxies for task force members, it's a little hard to distinguish. Just a reminder that. Um, for members of the public, please do put your questions in the task in the chat if you have them. But we're going to try to prioritize task force discussion only because we have we're limited on time, and there is going to be a, a pretty significant public comment period. So um, thank you for that, and I think we can keep going. So now we're going to jump into the recommendations um, themselves and. I think I'm going to turn to you, Grace or Erica. I think Erica to summarize what we've heard in the survey. It's Great. me. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so thanks everybody who took the survey. Um, this was a really helpful way for us to get your feedback ahead of time and kind of talk through, um, you know, what we needed to focus on today. So again, thank you everyone for um, all of your thoughtful feedback and taking the time to watch the recording and and put your thoughts in. So. Um, just some major highlights. We had 15 people respond to the survey, so 60% of our task force members did submit their, um, their comments. A majority of those respondents felt comfortable or had no strong opinion on all 12 proposed recommendations. So um, when I say a majority, I mean more than 50%. So um, that's a great um, indicator that, you know, the, the recommendations are going in the right direction. Um, over 80% of respondents felt comfortable with eight of the 12 proposed recommendations as is or with minor tweaks. So um, that's also great news. That means we can focus um, on four recommendations that received the bulk of the feedback. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to hoping, that's what we're hoping to hop into today. 
So again, just to kind of detail, um, dive into some of the, the nitty gritty, right? 100% of our responders, so all 15 responses, felt comfortable with four proposed recommendations as is or with minor tweaks. So that means, you know, they might've had a comment, but um, we're mostly on board or totally on board. And that is where recommendations one, three, four, and five, the annual diversion plan, the education requirements, the education best practices, and the definitions. Another high uh, achiever was were, uh, recommendations two and nine. We had 93.3% re of respondents, which is 14 out of 15 respondents. Um, comfortable with those as is or with minor tweaks. And then um, another set, uh, 11 and 12, 80% of our responders, so 13 of the 15 responses felt comfortable as is or with minor tweaks. So if you remember from taking the survey, the options were, you know, I'm comfortable with this as is or with minor tweaks. I don't feel strongly one way or another, or I have concerns or comments that I'll provide um, in the in the long form. So um, across the board, not too many major concerns. Next slide. Um, so with that, that's kind of how er we did Erica, sorry, yes. can, I, can I just pause you just for one second? Could we go back to the side? Because that was a lot of information. Oh, sure. And I'm just wondering if anyone on the task force has questions about these just the big picture of how you all responded and give you a chance to look at this because this this really is determining how we're structuring and focusing today's meeting. Anyone have any big just clarification questions here? Okay. Thank cool. you. I just want to make sure. No, thank you for slowing me down. I'm just, you know, really ready to dive in. Um, I know. It's great. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I want to do next is kind of talk through some of the notes on um, some of the recommendations that we're, we're not going to focus on today, right? Um, just so that you all know how we're going to incorporate the feedback that you did provide. Um, so starting with the financial support programs, right, we got a couple of comments there. Um, I think that's that the comments we got are a lot like what we'll hear in public comment. So additional ideas for supports, you know, yes and, yes and. Um, things like providing guidance to businesses that can share services to reduce their costs and save space. Um, another comment also suggested that if grant or incentive programs are going to be structured for certain types of businesses and organizations, then, you know, those terms would need to be defined. So I think that um, our plan is to incorporate all of that feedback um, before that uh, recommendation is released. Similarly, with CND definitions and roles, um, we had a comment to consider separate requirements for demolition versus new construction. Uh, the CND working group contemplated this, um, but not at the depth of a recommendation. So I think um, that's another one that we can explore in more detail during the public outreach section uh, of the timeline. Uh, regarding CND compli compliance, we had a suggestion to change the title to CND compliance standards. So that's a, a wording change that we're, um, we can easily and will make. And then finally, for enforcement, um, there were some suggestions. Um, one was to allow um, people to file complaints for noncompliance. We do have that ability right now. So if you go to the CASER website, um, and maybe someone from CASER can drop that in the chat for folks. Um, you know, you, there's a link to that right now. Um, so that comment has, you know, taken care of. There was also a suggestion to maintain language about revoking certain licenses uh, for non-compliance after a certain number of violations. Um, that was only one comment. Um, so I think we can leave the recommendation as is. I know this task force, um, you know, was really strongly leaning toward not doing that um, at all, not uh, revoking licensure as a means of livelihood as a penalty. So I think, you know, that's one we can address during public comment, but we won't focus on today. So that's kind of um, a summary, uh, a preview, if you will, of what you'll see in the updated recommendations in the green box um, when they come out for public comment. And with that, um, I think I will pass it to Ryan to talk through a little bit how we're going to cover recommendation six, seven, eight, and 10. And those are all around phasing. Um, that's where we received the bulk of the comments. And, you know, as a reminder, I think it's important to note that, you know, the majority of respondents felt pretty comfortable. Um, and it was, you know, they had a lot of suggestions for improvement. And so we'll talk through those and really nail those down so that the recommendations can be as tailored as possible. 
Great. Thank you so much, Erica. So, um, you know, as you can see, a lot of you spent a bunch of time um, and, and we really appreciate it because it helped enormously to get today's meeting prepared and also to it will help us get through all the recommendations. Um, we so we want to make sure, though, that you all are comfortable at this point, based on what you've heard, proceeding and specifically focusing on these four recommendations in our next you know, hour and a half or so um, discussion. And it may be that we get through these in much less time, and then we can turn to the other recommendations that where you all were pretty much okay, but people had a number of good suggestions and those are all being tracked um, as well. So in fact, before we, we keep going, Grace, do you wanna say anything more about how you all as a city are tracking all of the comments that you're receiving so far from the task force and and likewise from the public. Sure. Well, actually, you know this the survey that um, that Erica created for us that poll that was the first like official documentation outside of a conversation. Right. We've been obviously everything's been documented so far by actually drafting the recommendations by the work groups. I mean that's that's where the task force's input has been you know has has actually been written down. Now that we're going to be entering the, the public comment session, I think we still have to figure out exactly what our website will look like, but I really like that um, that Google form because then it, it actually, we're able to download the responses, we're able to put it to an Excel sheet. Like if we can continue to, to utilize something like that throughout the period, it'll be really easy for us to track the comments and which recommendation they go with. So we'll, we'll, keep, it, we'll keep an eye on, we're gonna figure out how to do that format. But in, and I don't want to take too much time, Ryan, right now in the public comment period because we're gonna, you know, conclude the the conversation today talking about that. But just suffice to say, we're gonna have comments that are gonna come through our website. We're gonna also obviously going to have in person discussions with different focus group groups and different constituencies, and all that will be written down in notes. And then eventually, it'll all be put together. So if we can maybe leave it there for now, and then um, come back to it at the end. Perfect. So just know that um, our the proposal here. For the, for the bulk of today's meeting then is to focus initially on these four recommendations at the bottom in yellow. And then we will um, touch on these other ones if there's time, time permitting. And at the very least, we will be tracking them, tracking all of your comments and suggestions, sort of the tweaks around the edges um, to improve these, knowing that people are generally in strong support. So um, I see Brian Loma's comment in the chat that that sounds good, but can you, um, Blake, go to the next slide because we just wanna make sure that folks are comfortable. Um, we, we know that there's probably a couple of you who have on the task force who have not had enough time to listen to the briefing closely and to look through all the recommendations and you're gonna be playing catch up a little bit and we're happy to talk with you offline as well. But um, do the we just wanna make sure most of you feel comfortable proceeding to dive into these four recommendations in particular and are not going to feel like um, you have huge qualms about that approach. So are people good? And, and if so, we'll dive in. But I just wanted to pause for a second. Any major qualms with this approach? Okay. Thanks, Councilman Hines. Um, Marguerite, I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay. We assume that you're good. All right. So with that, Blake, I think you can go to the next slide and we are gonna start with recommendation six and seven, which have to do with the timeline. And Blake, I think I'm turning to you. Is that right for this one? Yes, yep. Um, Eric and I will tag team this, so. Okay. Um, and just, and, and sorry, Blake, I'm so sorry to interrupt, just to tell people in terms of format and how we're gonna do this to, so you all know what to expect. You're gonna hear from the staff um, a summary of what the work group has come up with. You've already seen these slides. You've already heard this in the briefing. And then most pertinently, you're going to hear from the staff a summary of the comments that have been received thus far and some of any of the concerns or suggestions expressed. And then we're going to open it up to see if people have additional considerations and think about what creative solutions we can come up with um, to address the outstanding concerns. So that's that's the approach here. And Blake, I'm sorry to interrupt. Back to you. No, it's perfectly okay. So yeah, for everybody, I think this is probably going to be familiar. So the, this is essentially just a recap of what the existing recommendations are for which everybody had a chance to respond to. 
So um, what we're talking about here is the compliance timeline for residential buildings to provide uh, access uh, and service for recycling and composting. And uh, a few, just again, for, for recollection, um, we had an original recommendation about two sessions ago of uh, phasing in buildings uh, respective of their size by 12 months, 24 months, and 36 months. Um, in, in discussion, we identified that that was not quite fast enough for comfort. And so we have accelerated that timeline to 12, 18, and 24 months. So again, just, just for recollection of what the actual uh, recommendation here was. And the same goes for non-residential buildings. So um, exactly the same timeline. Again, the only difference here being we're differentiating buildings um, and their compliance timeline by square footage and dwelling unit for uh, residential. So the good news is um, we do have a majority of folks that felt quite comfortable with this recommendation as proposed. Although there are some, um, some minor tweaks that have been identified and some concerns. So we're gonna walk through that. Um, so on the left there, you have a sort of a summary of, of those raw comments that were submitted through the survey. And I'll just highlight a few just, just for discussion. Um, so first, you know, recycling should be included right away, but that composting could have a phased approach. Um, and then there's another comment, I believe, in this about, you know, potentially phasing in compost after recycling. So definitely something worthy of discussion. Um, but I think the, the majority of the comments are really just still trying to get a sense of, is this the appropriate timeline? Um, and so we've got some that basically talk about you know, there, there wants to be a slower phase in um, that's on one side. And then on the other, it's um, actually wanting to see a faster timeline. Um, uh, so, um, you know, pulling, pulling forward that uh, the existing recommendation for a faster implementation timeline. So I, a uh, hand is, up and I think what we'll do is, Blake, um, feel free to go through what you want to on this slide and what you want to, people to know about the discussions that have been happening so far to balance all these things. And then we'll open it up for additional comments or questions before we then go to any remaining idea, any ideas. So is there anything else you want to add, Blake? No, I, I mean, I, this is this is really the meat and potatoes of, of the ordinance. Um, so, you know, again, just for context, uh, the vast majority of the covered entities or the businesses or the buildings that will need to comply with the Waste No, Waste no More ordinance fall under these timelines. So we, we will be discussing timeline for, you know, construction and demolition, um, for special events, later in today's presentation, but I think it's important to note that the, the sheer volume, it's probably something like 90% or greater of the individual businesses that will need to comply with the ordinance fall into this category. So it is, it is quite important. And uh, I think, you know, the, there's a little bit of a disconnect still, I think with the task force, there's members that would like a slower timeline. There's there's members that would like a faster timeline. And I, I again, I think that's really important that we, we lead off and we talk this through as this will have um, the most impact on how the city rolls this out. Thanks. Erica, Grace, is there anything you all want to say just finally about the work group discussions and these comments before we open it up? Okay, okay great. Um, so Let's see, Drew, I see your hand up and I know you're stepping in for Peggy and she's been involved in these discussions up till now. So hopefully you're picking up from her, um, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, and forgive me for not having these as written comments. Uh, I didn't have the clearance to participate in the written portion of this commentary. Uh, but for our industry, the issue is, is less the specific time frame for compliance and more the triggering date that starts those time frames. But right now, and I agree with the, the thought that there's a very big distinction between 
the recycle product and the composting product because there's an existing infrastructure for recycling, but there is no existing infrastructure for composting. And without a path and a clear path and an existing path for compliance, any compliance schedule becomes unpredictable. If you give somebody a 24 month period uh, to comply and there's not a viable compliance mechanism for 23 months, then you haven't given much lead time. On the other hand, if tomorrow somebody develops a composting product where you can hire a vendor, uh, then these disclosed timeframes um, are what they appear on paper. So I think the fix is, regardless of the length of time for compliance on composting, is the trigger date has to be tied to when and if there is a path to compliance. So I'm going to, I think, so Drew, just so you know, the word noting all these comments, um, including comments that haven't, you all didn't have a chance to note on the survey. I, you know, certainly those of you involved in work group discussions and past discussions on this, please feel free to, to just, you know, share thoughts, but I do want to keep us moving. And I know Christy's got her hand up too, but doesn't any of you from the work group or staff who were in the work group discussions want to comment on that before we keep going. And, and I can mention something about that, right? Um, just from an enforcement perspective, right? A lot of the enforcement and compliance tools in the toolkit that the task force is comfortable with are education first, right? And, um, you know, not overly punitive, right? And so if there is, um, you know, if someone's making a good faith effort to comply um, and it, there just are not the appropriate supports um, to be able to support that, um, I think that's going to come into that's going to come into account when um, you know the agency is assessing compliance, right? So um, your point is well taken, Drew. Um, however, I think the task force agreed that there are, you know, the penalties are going to be extremely lenient, right? It's it's more of an education first. Um, uh, compliance driven goal um, than anything. Um, it's not an ordinance that is gonna be set up to punish folks, especially if there's not the means for them to comply. And if there's follow-up comments on that, you're welcome to to put them in the chat or put your hand up again later, Drew, um, and wanna make sure we- All right, noted, I won't interrupt again, thank no, you. No, no, you're fine. There's no, it's not an interruption. It's, it's great, it's good to hear. Um, Christy, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I won't um, echo what Erica already shared as far as education and, you know, the enforcement mecha mechanisms focusing on um, starting the onboarding process and, and supporting folks as they um, as they come into compliance. Obviously, there's also uh, the fact that, you know, as far as I understand it, this whole path to compliance piece is part of what we're it's exactly what we're making recommendations on, and that will be detailed in the rulemaking period, exactly what that path to compliance will look like. But we're all seemingly, the majority is in agreement that we're going to start with education and support and punitive methods of enforcement are absolutely last on everyone's list. And I just, I know we have a lot of folks listening in on this meeting who haven't been on our previous meetings. The comments regarding the complete lack of infrastructure um, for composting in our region or lack of vendors providing um, composting service that would not be in compliance, even compliance being undefined at this point is simply untrue. Obviously our infrastructure regionally and statewide has to grow to meet this demand, but that's not a reason to slow down the enforcement, the, the, the implementation of this ordinance. And it's just simply untrue that there aren't vendors or infrastructure to support composting for multifamily buildings in the city and county of Denver. Um, and, and I know you say that as someone who, who does this. Um, yes. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know yeah. that we have Compost Colorado represented and, you know, at least four small haulers. I know the larger haulers are working on ramping up their infrastructure, but let's not skew the conversation to wait until only the larger haulers are ready. There's plenty of opportunity and there are plenty of us who are already doing this already. And, um, okay, 
I, I know that these are conversations that have happened quite a bit. We we definitely don't want to, I don't want to quell um, comments that you all have or conversation that needs to happen. And I also want to make sure that um, as that you all as a task force at this point have you all, I think, and I hope have a sense of the collective interests that we need to satisfy in order to get to a set of recommendations that you all can feel good about as a task force and everyone can live with. So I'm hoping that in this conversation, you're able, you all are able to put your hats on in terms of, okay, how can we be problem solvers to find a creative solution to each of these recommendations that threads the needle, knowing that there's a lot of complicated considerations and a lot of needs that you all are trying to balance. So I really appreciate people bringing up, you know, remaining concerns and also especially ideas and proposals for addressing them in ways that meet all of these um, concurrent needs. So I think with that, I would just, you know, turn back to um, the city to see if you all at this point, um, based on what you've heard in the summary of these comments, do you all have any other final suggestions here? And then we can open it up to see if others do as well before we keep going to the other recommendations. So I'm I'm taking that to mean that you all are you're you're ready to just see if anyone else has any based on all of this any suggestions for final tweaks before we move on to the next recommendations because we're hoping that coming out of today's meeting you all as task force members are at least comfortable enough with the proposal for recommendations six and seven that you're able to live with it going out to public comment knowing that this has not been approved in any way and you're waiting at this point to see what. <laughs> what you what else you hear so any other proposals here marguerite i see your hand up yeah please go ahead well i think the the phasing um longer phasing of composting is potentially valid but i am curious if that recommendation came from the organics subgroup on the task force or from outside of there and really um, what the organic subgroup thinks about that recommendation, um, or if those people who work in that field know more than me about it, like would recommend that, or yeah, do we mm -hmm. do we? Know? Thanks, Marguerite. Yeah, I'd be happy to happy Please. to speak to that, Marguerite. So there, we actually, I, I would say briefly, it has been brought up. It is not currently a recommendation or a proposed recommendation from that group. Um, I think we mostly talked about existing barriers and gaps for success and then strategies for, for filling those gaps, um, which ultimately we've landed on about four or five recommendations. A lot of them have to do with the, just the need for education and outreach to, you know, what types of education and outreach, what is the topic, what are the main focus, you know, that being contamination, um, and so, no, it actually was not or it, and is not a current recommendation coming from that group. Is there anyone from the who's been part of those uh, organics discussions that wants to add anything to this just in response to Marguerite's question and Blake's initial thoughts here? And I know, Blake, you you have been convening those conversations. Yeah, Brian. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm super excited to highlight and uh, support Blake's answer there that the, the the task force really focused on how can we make sure that there are supports coming out of the city to promote more transfer station opportunities to help uh, with businesses reducing the amount of contamination and the fact that there are efforts at the state level both uh, in the recycling, but in the organics diversion as well, uh, where the state and the legislator are ramping up regulations to bring organics diversion to a higher level. So it's not just Denver, but our state also working on those things. Thanks, Brian. And I see three other comments. So um, I think Clinton and then Renee. Oh, Brian said it great, and so did so did um well both Brian's <laughs> double Brian, um like the volume yes there's going to be a lot of volume and it's going to be in volume increase and there's going to need going to be need for infrastructure one hundred percent we all know this um and and we're not there yet but if we start small 
focus on simple organics, then yes, we, we can start rolling this out and build on success. That's been a lot of the big conversations that we've been having, but contamination will shut the whole thing down. And that's, everybody knows that. Big challenge and, with this. Oh, I think someone, someone speaking who might need to mute themselves, but keep going. Sorry, Clinton. Oh, I can, I can stop there. Um, okay. You know, it is a large, it, it, the volume of material that we're talking about is a lot and we need more people. We need more infrastructure, period but we got to get there, so. Thank you, thanks. Renee. Thank you so much. Um, this is kind of taking a, a turn away from uh, composting specific, just back into the, the broader discussion of timeline. Um, <clears throat> I put it in the chat, but, you know, it was really helpful when Blake said that this is 90% of you know, uh, the, biz, the entities that will be impacted by the ordinance. And I'm wondering if we can break that down further into, you know, how, how many fall under the 12 months, 18 months, 24 months to kind of help guide because um, <clears throat> I don't, I know we're, we're looking, we want to make the biggest impact the fastest. Um, and, you know, while still making some room for, for, for learning, education, compliance, all of those things, but, uh, just wanted to, that doesn't have to be available today, but if that information can be available when it goes out for public comment, I think that that would also help people contextualize it a little bit more. Mm. Thanks, Renee. Does anyone from the city want to say anything about that? Other yeah, than I'll, I'll comment on that. I think Renee, we can, we can quantify that to an extent. Right, so our office um, runs the be building benchmarking requirement program. And so we know that there are approximately 6,000 buildings, 25,000 square feet and larger, and that includes uh, multifamily buildings. We, I don't, I don't know. I think we still have to put together a couple of different databases to completely um, separate out, you know, how many of those are 75 units and more and how many are 25 units up to 74 units. So there's a little bit of massaging we have to do yet. I don't know that we have that at the tip of our fingers, but we can certainly, um, we can certainly do our best to try to quantify that um, during the public comment period. Yeah, and I know a number of you or a few of you have raised over our recent meetings, just the interest in any kind of analysis um, from the city in terms of some of these topics and breaking down some of the numbers. So I think just uh, the city is definitely aware of your um, thoughts about this and the interest in getting as much quanti qualitative, quantitative data as possible, um, knowing the limitations on that. But Stephen, your hand went up, go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, Speaking for commercial buildings, when, and I and I don't mean to sound like a broken record. I mean, you know, a lot of them recycling already, composting. To Christie's point, there are services and stuff, but I think we have to remember that it's not like that. All of a sudden, those services are going to be at, at every building tomorrow, right? There has to be the RFP process and the vendors signing contracts and then train. I mean, so it's not something that's going to be able to be stood up overnight if they don't currently have it. And I know a lot of our members have struggled over time and you know changes and all of that. So I think that the composting is one of those pieces that is not gonna be as simple as the recycling is or has been. Um, I mean, there's challenges obviously depending on the property and all that with both. But I think that, you know, to Christy's point, while the services are out there, we have to have time for people to get those services stood up on their property and that could overwhelm the services, the server, the service providers, I think, too. So we need to, that's just my thought. Thanks, Stephen. So, yep, I think, Christy, you just put your hand back up again. So I assume you want to respond. Go ahead or add. Yeah, I would love to both add and respond. Stephen, totally hear you on that. I feel like from our end, you know, the holdup can be waiting for bin orders to come in, you know, when we're getting a whole bunch of new customers and that can cause a couple weeks delay. Sometimes the the delay is is from the side of property owners who have a specific process that takes a long time. Maybe it's something to consider in the ordinance if, you know, if services have already been bid but maybe not contracted yet. But certainly, you know, for us the turnaround time is 2 to 4 weeks. Um, I know that, you know, supply chain issues can affect 
our industry um, at different times for different reasons, but maybe that's a good point to consider in the rulemaking process that, you know, if a if a building, if a property management company or building ownership group is in the process of contracting services or bidding for services, then they're in compliance. Yeah, and I don't know if if anyone from the city wants to say anything more of, about that before I see both Ryan and Ian's hands are up um, in terms of if if someone is able to show that they are also have also tried to get services and can't, there would be an approach for that too. Yeah, I think we heard, I'll pop in just quickly before, sorry, Ryan, I'll let you talk, but I think we did hear quite a bit of that in the enforcement and compliance piece where, you know, um, and this was a, a pretty lengthy comment we got here, I, I trimmed it down just to fit, but right, it depends on how access is being defined, right? Um, and so being, um, I think that what we heard was that the bulk of, of folks want to make sure that, you know, good faith efforts are rewarded and, um egregious violators are the ones that that need any penalties right and so um by having an rfp out by having a contract in place and you're waiting on supply chain issues for bins or something like that wouldn't negatively affect your um you know status as compliant great thank you and i know that the questions like the one that was raised about access are definitely things that are going to be tracked and thought about and looked into in the whole public comment period as well because i think it's an understandable point um Ryan, and then Ian, go ahead. Hey, hey everyone, Ryan Call with EcoCycle here. Um, first, I want to say I, I think this timeline is good. I don't think it should go any faster than that, because to echo what Clinton said, uh, the compost systems are developing, and the biggest sticking point is, is contamination. And if we get contamination wrong, um, I worry that that we will have to go backwards and really we want to to build up strong systems and contamination gets in the way of that and based on what we know from other communities contamination yeah, yeah. happens at the front of the house specifically at restaurants um, so let's keep that in mind as we develop these systems and really focus on getting it right thanks ryan um ian go ahead Oh, Ian, you are muted and we can't hear you, but we see your hand raised. Are you able to unmute? If not, you might have to put your comment in the chat or text someone else who can raise it for you. Shoot. Okay, Ian, we're going to keep going because we can't hear you. It won't let you unmute. Um, I think you've been asked to unmute by the, from this end. I will let the folks handling tech see if they can address that. But um, you can also, Ian, you might want to try calling in from your phone audio just to see if that will allow you in. And whenever you're back or whenever we get the audio working, then we'll just come back to you. We won't forget. Um, in the meantime... We, um, before we, we go on, because we do want to get into um, a topic, uh, the special events recommendation and also the CND recommendations, but we want to make sure that people are more or less comfortable with these, this rec these two recommendations as they stand. We will come back to all of these at the very end, just so you can look at the language once more in narrative form, in a paragraph form um, to see what it says, but any final comments or huge concerns. Okay, knowing that we're going to come we're going to hear from Ian in a minute and we'll come back to him. So I think we um should go to the next knowing that there may be tweaks to this, you know, after public comment as well. But what if uh so Blake if you could res advance your slide. Yeah, and we'll go into special events and again just a reminder that we will recap at the end of this session, so we'll go back and look at the timeline language, just so you all see it one more time. Um, but go ahead. I think, Rose, you were going to um, summarize what special events looks like at this point. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, so up on the screen right now, we have the recommendation that we shared in the pre-meeting summary. Oh, 
Can we go back to slide 14? Great, thank you. Um, so this outlines the recommendation and what we heard. And I first wanna talk about the considerations that were taken into account with this recommendation. So first and foremost, I wanna note that this recommendation applies to section 48-138 under permitted special events. Event venues such as indoor and privately managed events will fall under the non-residential building section of the ordinance. Permitted events are outdoors and on public property. Um, this recommendation also took into account uh, uh, an earlier recommendation from the group to where possible follow paths and align with definitions in existing city code. Uh, additionally, taking into account the ballot sponsors and voter support for the intention to have the greater volume and impact waste producers first. Uh, additionally, we're taking into account the equity considerations for smaller and community driven events. Uh, the intent of the voters for all entities to be in compliance within a four year time frame time frame. Uh, feedback from the event industry stakeholders on a desire for phased implementation and the unique nature of permitted events needing night and weekend hauler pickups, as well as needing to vacate public spaces, uh, including streets and parks under time constraints. So right here, the summary rolls out 12 months from adoption, 10,000 or more attendees. 24 months from adoption, 3,000 or more attendees. And for events under 350 attendees, a comply by date, or sorry, over 350 attendees, a comply by date 36 months out from adoption. Uh, that being said, can we go to the next slide and talk about the comments we received? So in the survey, uh, the results that we got, we had about 75% of the survey participants felt comfortable or did not feel strongly one way or the other. We did have about 25% of the survey participants um, have specific concerns or suggestions to improve the proposed recommendation. And I'm gonna quickly talk about a few here uh, and highlight them. So one comment said that small events should have recycling right off the bat and only phase in compost. Another one says that, uh, the de minimis volume um, should incorporate events under 350 attendees. One comment uh, asked about phasing in small events first. Uh, one comment uh, proposed that large events over 3,000 people should comply by 2024. One comment stated that resources are available right now. Um, another one is asking about verifying atten event attendee size or event size and attendees. And the last one is why events would have a longer time frame than others. So that summarizes essentially what is being proposed, uh, the feedback we heard, and then I want to turn it over to this group to discuss. So at this point, Rose, um, are there suggestions out there like specific suggestions out there for tweaking this recommendation or is it um is that an open question so right now uh one comment has a suggestion here that well i guess there's there's a few suggestions one is that events over 3000 should all comply in 2024 which was would essentially take the proposed recommendation from 3 years down to 2 years um for the rollout um, and another recommendation is that uh, to only phase in compost and not recycling. So. And, and recycling starts from the get-go. From the get-go. Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So um, in light of that, I see Brian's hand is up and others feel free to chime in on this. Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so um, I think one of the big issues from the proponent's side is that we we recognize that we want a culture shift that was part of the intent of this measure and pushing events um to begin this process next year 
even if it's not a penalty or a mandate, but having special events, uh, the pe permitting people, putting this in front of people now as they're looking at their 2024 permitting so that they can get through the struggles of growing into this. We know from experience, we uh, waste no more volunteers working with EcoCycle and the Five Points Jazz Festival. We're able to, in one day, get over 90% effective diversion without vendor participation. But for these large groups and these large events, the issue is going to be communicating to all the suppliers and the vendors about the products to, pre to reduce the contamination impacts. And so while yes, we do, you know, we recognize that that timeline has to happen, promoting it and promoting the businesses that this is coming, the events need to start moving on it. Um, so that they are practicing next year is a key concern. Okay. So you're, you're, you and the petitioners are talking about how to minimize penalties while maximizing education and encouragement and starting to, and getting this on the radar and doing everything possible to get events to be doing this. Well, and because it's going to take time for them to learn how to implement it right. Right. That, that, you know, it would be the best opportunity if permits that are going out now, right. uh, um, you know, for next year's events are getting the information and starting to gear up. Okay. Had, you know, we had the, the Nugget celebration, for example, at Civic Center Park. And for those who were there, it might be hard to tell that the concept of a waste management plan even existed. Yep. So having this be part of the permitting process somehow as well. So um, do others want to chime in on that? Those of you, especially those of you who I know have been part of these work group discussions and have really delved into all these very um, difficult, competing, challenging needs. Brian, real quick, I just wanted to respond yeah. to Brian. Please. And yep. And then we'll go to Christy. Yeah, Yep. There's nothing stopping us from educating um, our permit holders now and pushing out this messaging. So I think that there's there's nothing barring us from that. I just don't know how that would be incorporated into this ordinance specifically, but that is something that our office can do. Okay. All right. So as you're saying the the impact and the effect of that education and messaging can start to be felt next year, even if it's not in the ordinance language. Correct. Okay. Yeah, let's hear from, so Christy and then Sonia. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'm extra vocal today. Um, I think this is a perfect opportunity, um, again, in sort of the process that, that um, proceeds our Waste No More Task Force process to reward events that are already in compliance. We alone are working three events this week, three events next week, and multiple events every week throughout the end of the summer. We've actually seen an uptick in communities and event companies that want zero waste services. We've seen a huge increase in sort of sub entities that are offering kind of zero waste management plan um, services to large events. So it's it's helping to spur this growth in the green economy, in this little piece of the green economy in the sector, which is lovely. And, you know, I, I strongly, um, uh, I, I don't feel good at all about the extended rollout for events over the three-year period. That being said, it is the smallest events and theoretically the smallest impact that are extended out to the longest time period. But I share the hesitation that, you know, it it just doesn't seem to line up that events would get so much longer to fully come into compliance. Um, but again, I think there are lots of events around the city and county of Denver um, that are already doing this. There are proven formulas for doing effective zero waste at, at events. Um, we're not the only company investing in it. There are plenty out there. And like I said, it's growing all the time. So perhaps thinking of some way to reward events that are already in compliance um, early. And again, really emphasize that education piece 
would be huge. And events are a really major opportunity, I think, for the city and county or for even, um, you know, neighborhoods um, or smaller, you know, kind of sub entities within the mun municipality to offer signage for rent, stations for rent, things like that other examples that we've seen around the country that have worked and helped events to kind of hit the ground running and have all the resources they need at their fingertips. Great. Thanks, Chrissy. And we can wrap, when we wrap this up, we can sort of come back to these pieces that you all are bringing up. But Sonia, I see your hand up and then uh, Andrea as well. Thank you. Um, I, I, um, the thing is, I, I'm all for education. I think it's I think it's great that we're really trying to find ways to educate people for as long of time as possible. My worry is a lot of these groups that are putting on events are nonprofits who have who have, by the way, oftentimes very slim, slim profit margin, just like another comment I made when we we along the way, I can't remember what section I put it under, was oh, I think it was under the financial support for for um, folks that are gonna have more of a challenge doing this is you, you can't just assume that if you fall under a certain category, you're going to need more help. And if you fall in another category, you're not going to need help. There are a lot of events that every penny counts. And this is just for them to learn, I think is, I, I have no problem with the education part. I just feel like, we, they, you know, there's a lot for them to try to figure out is how to work this into their budget. If you're saying you're going to put something in now for a permit for next year, when they're they may have already budgeted for an event happening next year, depending on when their fiscal year is. You're, you, I feel like you're just putting people in a difficult situation. So I feel like the recommendations are fair. I do fully support educating people now so they can be compliant when and fine if they want to do it early. But but I'm worried when you start talking about this somehow needs, might affect their permit or something else that they're, you know, just the, it, the, the part of the yeah. planning process of their event. Yep. I just feel like I keep hearing all oh, these things are available and people are going to be able to do it. But I will tell you, I've seen this happen over and over and over again, which is why I brought that one law up earlier, which I think it's passed five or six years ago at this point, and people still aren't compliant. It's it's easier said than done. And that's what I worry about. Yeah, thank you. And I know there's been a lot of talk both in the task force and in the work group about the difficulty for dis differentiating among events, knowing the understanding the slim profit margins for many um, and balancing that with the fact that there are services available and you all are trying to get the biggest bang for your buck while finding the opportunities to educate and make sure people are are you know are doing this. So anyway, I, it's tricky. And Andrea and then uh, Councilman Hines, I see your hand is up as well. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, two things, and one, I don't, I can kind of skip over because I was going to say exactly what Sonia said. The biggest question for me um, with um, making these mandates is is really the impact on the budget for the nonprofits, specifically specifically nonprofit producers of events. Um, giving a little bit more time will allow them to make the adjustments into their budgets and also work to find corporate sponsors that may you know, want to help underwrite some of the costs. So that's a huge thing for me. And then I've said since one of probably the first meeting that we had, I, I know that we're, we are modeling off of Austin, but I really, really believe that starting small, starting with the smaller, um, smaller events and then getting into the bigger ones, I think might make the process um, a little bit more successful. I think if we can figure out on a smaller scale, and I'm not saying like a hundred person event, it could be a 3000 person event that we consider to be small, but I just feel like knowing, you know, it's really important to learn and to, to do this well, so that we um, also can continue to show you know the public that this is this is a successful program and we're not just greenwashing here um so i thought those would be my recommendations or my comments thanks andrea and i see we have three other hands up so just asking other people if you want to ditto what other people have said and then provide some kind of a, a tweak or gloss or proposal feel free to do so um councilman heinz and then uh let's see and then renee and then clinton and can you hear me we yes. Sure okay. Super. Um, so I, I think if I understand uh, what Brian was saying, um, the pushback that I'm hearing from the Restaurant Association and others is about enforcement and not so much education. And so uh, I know with the rental registry, 
um, you know, that's live and uh, we've had really low compliance rates. And the people that are reached out to in District 10, they uh, that that are landlords, they said, we don't know anything about it. So, um, so I would strongly encourage, even if we're not having any sort of enforcement, I would strongly encourage making the education part of the permit process as fast as possible, so that we um, we don't have anyone who says, "I don't know what you're talking about," and then they throw an event that's large or small, who cares, um, you know, whatever the event is. Once uh, there is a requirement for compliance, and they say we had no idea, I want everyone to know. Uh, years in advance before the uh, compliance is a requirement. Uh, so right. if if we put it in the ordinance or not, um, or in, well, I guess it's, uh, in the rulemaking, I would say we definitely should do make the education part of the permitting process as fast as possible. Thank you. Yep. That sounds consistent with what we heard from Brian as well. Um, Renee and then Clinton. It, would it be possible, Ryan, sorry, just for me to hop in there in response to council? Yes. Um, and, and yeah, just, I think that's useful. Just for a point of... Um, knowledge, right? Um, because we run the residential rental program out of our office. We um, are approaching the, it's a phased in license. The full uh, requirement will go, will be January 1st, 2024. We've been talking about this since 2020. Um, Councilman, Councilwoman Gilmore uh, has been talking about it. It passed in 21. So we're two years into our education campaign. We have done extensive education campaign. I mean, we sent postcards to every single uh, landlord we had contact information for. And to Councilman's point, there are still people who, despite this huge push, still don't know about it. Um, and so, you know, it is it is tough, right? Uh, it is some, a reality that, you know, there are people who, regardless of what the city does or, or how we educate, right? There, I think how I heard Sonia's concerns and the restaurant association's concerns is something I hear from licensees, right? I, my job isn't to keep up with regulations and follow the law and keep track of changes like my job is to run my food truck. My job is to run my business and so um, you know that extra time is to try to reach people where they are um, and it's not to avoid compliance it's not to push it down the road it's you know really to make them feel like their backs up not up against a wall so just a little extra perspective I, I know that this is not brand new or um, I know it was on the ballot and so there's a little bit more um, you know um, what's the word I'm looking for knowledge around it publicly right than a license that passed at city council I think it's different when the public opts in but um, you know just wanted to fill out that perspective um, because that that's what I heard when when I heard Sonia speaking thanks Erica mm -hmm. um, okay Sonia or uh, Renee you've got your hand up and then um, we'll see if there's anyone else and then see if we can um, yep. find the elegant solution. Yeah, go ahead. So I am not going to bury the lead. Um, I am going to say that I would like the recommendation actually to be that um, in 2024, it's events up to 3,000 people. And then the following year, uh, 2025, would be events greater than 3,000 people. So I echo what Andrea is saying. And I 100% am coming at that from a lens of success, right? Because the way that it's written is that events have to provide access to recycling and compost, but it doesn't spell out actual success. And I believe very strongly that if we're pushing these events that have 50,000 people to have recycling and have composting, um, it will not meet the, the, the actual the, the actual core of what we're trying to do. Um, so that is, that's my official recommendation and I will pass the baton. Okay, thank you. And then I might, you know, after Brian, I think I see your hand up again. I'll pass it back to, especially if there's anyone on who's been part of the work group and is hearing what's happening, to, what the discussion today, I know that some of these have been direct concerns and questions have been directly discussed in the work group. Um, so anyway, we'll come back to that, but yeah, Brian, go ahead. Sorry, I asked in the chat, but I didn't get a response uh, directly. I'm really interested about the scrap said that they're doing events now and that people are signing up and I'm really interested in the sizing. I'm not gonna uh, hide anything. I am the one who, um, 
thinks that events that are less than 300 should not be considered de minimis um, or that there should be some kind of consideration to that. Um, also, I just want to reiterate that, you know, not only did the Waste No More volunteers in one day do greater than 90% diversion for one 10,000 person plus event, um, but we did that without the vendors being prepared, without uh, the full regulations of signage. And I think that those those things complement each other. We have to remember that that with the waste management plan, the organization is going to figure out where they're at, where their waste systems are at, where their signage is posted to help and encourage that participation. And based on uh, events, even at, at Red Rocks and Levitt Pavilion, when there are adequate quantities of well-labeled bins, in general, the majority of the public participates voluntarily. Thanks, Brian. So um, there's there's a number of things that have been shared, and and obviously you all have differing. Some of you have differing perspectives on this, but I definitely hear some common principles. Clinton, I I guess let's turn to you because I saw your hand just go up again, and then I think it might be helpful for us to articulate some common principles that were kind of that we're hearing across the board and then seeing what we can do to thread the needle on them. So yeah, go ahead, Clinton. I'm trying to think how to be best helpful here. Um, <clears throat> I'm the one that put in the comment about stalling, starting smaller than, than larger. And the main reason, there's two reasons specifically when it comes to organics collection at events. Smaller is more controlled, and you can really learn some best management practices that potentially could be expanded into a larger event, maybe. But also, if you flip this, events have a lot of control mechanisms, we believe, if implemented correctly with sortation, contamination verification, choosing the proper materials for your event based on if it should be recycled or composted, et cetera that we can learn a lot from them for best management practices for organic collections. Scraps is doing this, EcoCycle has done this. There's a big win there, but I think just like starting organics collection, starting small, starting simple is better than starting huge and having to backtrack and fix it. So I, it's complicated, but I'm just yeah. gonna put that there. Thank you. And um, Rose, I see your hand is up. And um, so definitely want to hear from you. And it does sound to me like, I mean, you all all are very much, I think, united on we want to do this well. And there's some question about, well, is that best done by starting small? Is it best done by? Anyway, there's some different ideas about that. Um, Rose, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, there's a lot going on between the comments and the chat, and I want to try to um, reflect back what I'm hearing and get an idea of where this group wants to go with this recommendation. So in response to um, Brian's comment about under 350, I'm curious as to what the ballot sponsors, what their thoughts were with de minimis. I will say that when we get under 350 regarding the permitting processes in the city, we're going to have to tease out some nuances there because the permitting processes um, with our office can easily capture waste management plans. But again, when we start getting into like a residential block party, which if they're residents of Denver, we'll have three, three stream waste, there aren't um, processes in place for oversight of those waste management plans, they don't exist currently. So if that is something we wanna change in the recommendation, that's, I think those are a few things we're gonna have to tease out. From our office specifically, uh, I pulled the report this morning and we have something like 4% of the events that go through special events permitting are under 350. So. It's, it's a small amount as far as where our office is concerned, uh, public events permitted on public property. So that is one thing I wanted to address. The next 
is that what I'm hearing from this group today is that they want small events to go first and they want to flip flop this timeline. And I think it's important for us to call out, like, where are the group's priorities here? Is it the high impact most important? Uh, in which case, the larger events have more volume. Also, in the equity discussion, it, it was the, quite the opposite, is that they wanted those smaller community events. We already hear a lot from city council and from RNOs that there are too many barriers for them to activate their public spaces. So that was kind of the thinking behind having the larger events go first and the smaller events go second was in line with those equity discussions. Um, again, as Andrea pointed out, most of the events that are permitted on public property are nonprofit. Um, they have little to no ROI that I'm aware of, and they need time to plan for those services. Um, so I just kind of want to tease out here, where are our priorities? Is it the impact? Is it the equity? Uh, what, what do we want to prioritize when making this recommendation? Well, and, you know, I, I guess one of the things I just wanted to say, too, is that we, I think I have been privy to conversations that the work group, you know, re reports, report outs from the work group and conversations amongst the city staff trying to um digest all of this that that this is a really complicated recommendation there's a lot of nuanced considerations including some universal interest in you know not penalizing nonprofits not penalizing um small community based events that are you know and at the same time seeing these events as opportunities and opportunities for education and just ways to make this successful and so i think that there's a lot of aligned overall principles about this. I think the devil's in the details. And so one possibility is that we spend a bit more time um, both with a, a small group that can take some of these comments and take another crack at this over the next, you know, week and a half um, to um, come up with a, a nuanced um, way to address some of the things that have been raised today, but also we're going to hear public, we're going to, we're going to have a public comment period in which we hear some nuanced um, input about what others are saying across the city and time to be thinking more creatively about this. So I do, I do really encourage people. We're not going to, we're not going to be able to, um, I don't think any of us want to have a recommendation that goes to council that basically says no one could agree. I think we want you all to be problem solvers and put on a hat, your hats of, okay, we know we have these, these collective interests in seeing this succeed without penalizing small entities. Let's see how we can creatively do that. And, and I know it, it, it's not easy. So that's what I would challenge folks to think about and would love to, and Marguerite, I see your hand just went up. So go to you, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to continue this conversation. You know, I didn't, deep dive into the special events work group, but I have heard the conversation through the plenaries. And something that I really liked about the recommendations is that we should be looking at them not just individually, but really as a package. And recommendation two talks a lot about financial support. And it's also really flexible that I think leaves a lot of creativity to the city and county to determine how to incentivize some of these really small nonprofits that have really shoestring budgets. So I think that concern um, for me isn't too huge because of that, that. And then even also, I mean, the enforcement piece and we didn't really see, and maybe this will come up later, but in recommendations, I don't really see a lot about waivers and exemptions, um, but you know, that that could also play a role in some of these smaller nonprofits that are running these events. Um, so so that's one thought. Uh, on the phasing, I think it's not just for what I've heard in, in these groups for impact and for equity, um, which I do think both of those things can be met and, and um, in, I think, how it's written right now, um, but also for education and peer sharing. And I think if we are hitting those larger events, um, there's more of a proof of concept that this is all possible. And also I'm seeing a lot in the chat about how there's already been a lot of pilots, how, you know, a lot of different, you know, composters have been doing these events for a long time. So I think that 
that concern about um, success not happening with big events isn't fully founded from what I've heard, but just wanted to kind of summarize what I've been hearing throughout um, to hopefully evolve the conversation. I really, I really appreciate that, Marguerite. Thank you. And um, and Rose, Grace, um, others, Ian just put a note in the chat to clarify that in terms of compliance for special events, is this a waste plan? Is this just a waste plan um, at this point? That's an interesting. I mean, I'm going to, well, I shouldn't cut off Rose. Rose, you go first. Uh, that's my understanding right now is for them to have a waste management plan, but also as the ordinance is currently written, it's that that waste plan must include three stream. Right. And so I guess the, the question then is, Ian, these are so public, right? I mean, that's the definition of a special event is it's for the public. And so, you know, if all we did was require that they submit a plan and then, you know, it's kind of known that they don't actually have to have it in place and then that's not really compliance, right? So I think we are, we're all looking ahead to the moment when people walk in the, the gates of an event and they expect to see those three streams there. We wanna make sure that it's more than just the plan. I'm sorry, there's so many comments in the chat. I'm, I'm not keeping up on them all. I, uh, I'm, gonna yeah. I'm just gonna reiterate one thing for this group because I think it's really, really, really important. I just wanna say it one more time that indoor venues, if we're looking at like ball arena, if we're looking, and I guess, you know, even in power field, even though it's outdoors, those event venues are not permitted events. They do not get permitted by the city. Those are going to be under the, uh, a different section of the ordinance for um, non-residential buildings and that they are, um, those are event venues. And those are specifically called out somewhere else in the ordinance. Events that are permitted by the city are public events on public property. So that's in a street, in a park, on a sidewalk, in an alley. So I just want to make sure that that group knows that distinction because it's going to really help us guide this, this section of the ordinance. That is what this recommendation is for, is for section 48-138. So I wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay, so I see um, Anna's hand is up. I saw Ryan's hand was up but it went down and then Ian's hand is up. Here's what I would love to propose for this last few minutes of talking about special events. And then I'm gonna suggest we take a five minute break so folks can grab water, use the bathroom, and then we'll come back. I really would challenge and encourage um, you all at this point to see what, listen to everything you've just heard, under, you know, know that we want to get to a recommendation that is supported by all of you, or at least that you can live with for purposes of going out to public comment and see if if there's a way that you can help this group get there. Um, so be thinking about that, Marguerite. I appreciate your comments along those lines and Rose. And with that, um, Ian and anyone else, I think a couple of hands just went down, but yeah, go ahead. Anna, yeah. I'm not I, sure which of you had your hands up, but I think it might've been Anna, so go ahead. Um, just touching on, so we're trying to figure out what's the balance between cost, impact and quality. And when we think about small events, I used to run small events for EcoCycle for two years. And so with small events, it's a lot less to, you don't need as many volunteers managing the bids. You don't need as much outreach labor to for vendor agreements. You don't need as many bins in general or as much service. You can get creative about taking bins back to your own house and taking the recycling or dividing it up among the people. So I think from a cost standpoint, it's less for nonprofits. From an impact standpoint, it's also a lot less, but you can have better quality. Um, when we're talking about, so so trying, I guess I'm echoing that if we're coming from a uh, cost and quality of waste stream, it could be easier to start with smaller events. Larger events are gonna take more volunteer power, more time and energy, and um, and then we're gonna have, yeah, more, more volunteers to check the quality. So I think it's important to highlight those two differences. I absolutely think big events can also do that and we have the infrastructure to, so I'm a proponent of not, I, I think I wrote the first comment because I don't think small events have any reason to postpone recycling um, and am open to the compost part. But I, I think um, it's an easier lift and better for quality of waste streams to start with small events 
And then um, for larger events, having those resources available through the city to help um, those groups carry that out and maintain quality is important. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anna. I appreciate sort of the trying to step back part um, of all that. Thank you. Uh, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, good. Your audio works. And you had something from earlier, too. So feel free to add that as well. Well, I don't want to get off. Well, I'll say what I was saying about six and seven, which is I heard the the concerns from the buildings like what happens if you have a contract error or there's some sort of um, problem with getting the goods you need to be able to open up your waste. We have exemptions written in for that exact example. So if that happens to 90% of people, like that's one thing that maybe we, we could, we can't guess it will happen, but it just seems to me like we've already thought through that process as if, you know, if there are supply chain issues or whatever, we've already created a process for those people who are having an issue. I don't think we need to delay everything um, and continue to push it off because of examples like that, because we've written a process for it. But this one, um, I had a question about de minimis under 35 or 350 person event. Perhaps this isn't a way that we could talk about how the city um, can help here. Cause I know like, for example, with like Denver days, the city helps arrange getting the, the uh, barricades to like start to block everything. And the city also helps underwrite the insurance that people need. And I know this cause I sat on Denver days when it was created. Perhaps there's a situation there where we can use education or city resources to help divert that waste because 350 people will still make a lot of waste. Um, now, I'm also in agreement that I think 3,000 or more should go now. I think that the the process, the projects, um, pilot projects you all are talking about have been happening for years. I've worked for scraps. I've volunteered to do that work. The best practices, the truth, the labeling, all of that. We have those parts figured out. I don't think that's new. But I do have a question for either Renee or or Andrea about the size and this conversation around nonprofits. Like for example, I know News Ed puts on Cinco de Mayo um, and that's a rather large festival. We're talking 100,000 people. Impact is real. I understand the bottom line component, but of these large events, how many of them are really nonprofit and how many of them are for-profit? Because I feel like the for-profit side should really have to angle towards that. And, I, and working in large events with you guys over the years, it seems to me like this is possible. I've seen large events do it for a year. Then they stop doing it for a year. They try again for a year because no one's really um, making them do it. And it, it just seems like it's very, very plausible. And you're also reducing how much trash service you have to order. So it's not 100% like additional cost. Yeah. And I, if it's okay, I'm going to make that a question to answer in the chat um, just because we really do need to wrap this up because I want to make sure we have time for c and 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 we have other things. So um, I here's my suggestion. I think at this point we have the proposal we have on the table is the one you're seeing before you. And um, I, I would be really welcome if folks have, I know that some of you have proposed alternatives. I'm not sure if there's, you know, enough. I haven't, I'm not sure if there's enough interest um, among other uh, task force members to change this in a way that will garner support of um, everyone, or at least a way to live with it for now, while you go out for more discussion and you have more discussion on some of the nuances. So um, I propose that we take a break and we come back in five minutes and see if we can figure out how to move forward with events. And then we go to C&D. Um, knowing that there may have to be a small group discussion after today's meeting on special events to get to a place where everyone can at least, you know, live with it. So um, is that, are people okay with that? If we, cause I know that some people really do have to run to the restroom and grab water. Knowing that, you know, I think, I think some of you, I think Marguerite, I think um, Anna, I think there's a couple of you who really like captured the global interests here that we're trying to balance. And it's a tough one. Okay, let's do that. Let's take a break. Um, it's 3.36. So can everyone come back, at least on my computer, can people come back at um, 3.41? We'll just take a quick five minute. Okay. Okay, thanks. See you in five minutes. All right, everyone. I wanna make sure that people are hydrating. It's hot out there. 
and everyone's rejoining. If you could turn on your video when you're back so we know when everyone's back, that would be great. I know some of you need your video off because you're you had it off before. Thank you. It's very hard to take a very short break and five minutes is short. Um, so here's here's my question. I know hopefully a couple of you have had some time to think about this now. We really have to put this special events recommendation to bed for now, knowing that it is not final and we definitely have some tinkering to do. And I'm wondering if people have given that some thought and if uh, folks have recommendations going forward, hearing everything you just heard. Um, Ian, I got a note that you, yeah, and I see your hand is up. So please go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to thank everybody for giving such deep thought to this and the consideration. I, it's really been a lot to think about. I, I hear some of the concerns about going with it small. It's written with the big producers going first. Can we send it with the big producers going first? Maybe the city can convene a stakeholder group with some of the smaller or the nonprofits in the month ahead. We can figure out uh, what the best path forward is and see where we come out the other side with recommendations. Okay, so you're, Ian, thank you. And I appreciate, I assume you're, I know you're speaking on behalf of, of the petitioners and sponsors of this. Um, so are people, that's my, that would be my proposal is that we keep this as is knowing that there is gonna be, need to be some discussion, especially with the smaller and nonprofit events um, and see what more, what comments come up. And I also get that a number of you have had some yeah. some alternate suggestions that may need to be thrown around as well during that public comment period. Are people able to live with that? Is anyone not able to live with that? Oh, did someone just say something? Yeah, it was me, Ryan. I was just going to say, we're planning to do outreach to our event permit holders in August as part of the task force plan. So let's see what comes out of that discussion before we land on where we think this recommendation should be that that's what my suggestion would be and maybe when this is when there is outreach specifically to events there can be some acknowledgement that this is a tricky one and that there's a lot of balancing of cost impact quality equity in this recommendation in particular and it's had a lot of attention from the task force so i think just acknowledging that um and if i so I am hoping that folks are okay with that. If people have major, major qualms and, and feel like they're not sure they can get on board with that for now, um, please make a note in the chat or put your hand up now. And otherwise I'm gonna keep us going to CND so that we have enough time for that one. Yeah, Brian, can you do so, real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Real, real quick, the only thing that I might offer as a suggestion is that it has been stated why our events going out to 27 when others have to be into 26 so if there is any scaling that back so that all events were done by 26 okay and maybe that's that can be something that gets put in the notes of that recommendation i know that we're keeping track with track changes of task force suggestions. Um, and we can see if that's something that folks will support, can support also in out in the public. But for now, this is what we've got. We're gonna go on to C and D. And thanks everyone so much for your for thinking hard about this and Ian for your wrap-up comments. Um, okay. So everyone take a deep breath and sort of Shake out the body because we're gonna do one one last um, push on C and D. This has also been um, a really complicated one, and I know I really appreciate the fact that the work group members have thought hard about this. So I think I'm turning to Jessica. Is that you? Is that right, Jessica? And yeah. yeah. And and why don't we do this? We definitely have seen that these complicated recommendations. We could talk for a long time and um, about them, and so. I would suggest that after Jessica, we hear from you about what you have heard regarding this recommendation, we front load 
proposals. If anyone has a proposal, specific proposal for tweaking this recommendation and see if it's something that, you know, can be supported enough to change it. Um, and otherwise we solicit comments about it during public outreach as well. But I, so that would be my suggestion. I'm going to just turn it to you. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Thank so you. hi everyone. Um, so the C and D working group put out three recommendations. The one that kind of needed more discussion and had the most um, comments was the phasing recommendation. So as a recap, the group proposed that we add in three levels of phasing for C and D with the thought that that it'll allow time for more stakeholder input, allow us to gather data, and also allow for these end markets to develop. Um, recognizing that 100% diversion for construction and demolition is, is not really possible without fully deconstructing a building. So, uh, and, and having the right people to do that job. So giving, giving us the time to set up that environment. Uh, and then also the group recommended that we change the effective date to 180 days after the rule made, making, understanding that the required materials will be listed in the rules, um, but then no later than January 1, 2025. Um, so that that's pretty much the, the summary of that. I guess I would add that the reason why we broke it up this way from you know, starting at 50%, that's from what we heard in our working group, that was, you know, where a lot of the asphalt and concrete recycling would come into play. So we know a lot of people are doing that today. There's also a lot of people that are not doing that today. So just kind of getting everyone up to the same level for the beginning, allowing us to gather the data. And then after asphalt and concrete, you get more into the donation uh, reuse the construction world, and you start to build up those end markets, specifically um, clean wood being probably the most complicated material required on the list that we uh, that we talked about. And so getting from 65 to 80% then would be lots more deconstruction, certified deconstruction contractors was something that the group recommended would be like a support to make that um, possible. But but really allowing the time for for Denver's end markets to develop to to support these goals. So in this mandate, technically. Um, so now going into what we heard from this recommendation from the from the survey. So um, I like, also, can you advance the slide, please? Oh, sorry, I advanced it on my own screen. So no I just want to thank you. I just want to say that I am not the owner of any of this information. So anyone in the in our C and D working group, if if you want to chime in and, and add context or um, to any of the reasoning behind the recommendations, and and if you'd like to respond to some of the comments that other people had on on this recommendation, uh, feel free to to step in. Uh, I'm just going to go through the comments I think that we heard from people. So um, one concern being that, that the market might not be there to accept all of these materials and that people shouldn't be penalized um, if, if they can't recycle up to that certain percentage. Um, I think that one thing I'd like to say is, is that way, that's why we put in the phasing to begin with is to make sure that people can um, be in compliance with, with, uh, with the requirements. Um, and then also we, the group did talk about some exemption processes or ways to, um, ways to, you know, work with the city if their materials were not accepted by the processor, or, you know, just put some exemption processes in place, some waivers in place for rare circumstances. Um, Anything on that one that the group wants to add before I keep moving? Cool. Um, and then one comment was that this could potentially create a snafu between the, the buildings and the event venue sectors. So I'm not totally sure what this one uh, really means. I understand our timing is a little bit different uh, from the rest of the groups in the Waste No More Ordinance, but 
you know, we are recognizing that C and D is is really its own beast, its own audience, its own materials, its own end markets, and and so that's why we're kind of operating on a little bit different of a schedule, but tried our best to to mirror what the rest of the groups were doing. Um, and you know, moving on, I think that there was definitely some conversation about the concerns of how we you know, of the length of the phases of the implementation timeline. And um, in the next comment is to see a five-year rollout instead of a six-year rollout. And, and that's something that I just wanted to bring to this group to discuss, like what would the proposed phasing timeline look like if you feel like this is too drawn out. Um, and and I think that that's something we could we could bring here. So if anyone wants to chime in on that one, Ryan. Jessica, I guess I would say that because there's been so much discussion in your work group and, you know, less so in the whole task force, but it might, because in, in light of time and the fact that we know that comments can go on for a long time, just, you know, in light of whatever we just, we just went through this with special events and it's because it's complicated. I guess I would suggest if you could, if you think that there's widespread support for changing that rollout, based on everything you've heard to maybe put that out there as a possible proposal. Um, other, otherwise, I think, you know, work group members, it'd be good to hear from you why you think it's the six year, not five year after I know what I know has been a lot of discussion. I'd, I'd yeah. actually like to hear from the, from the working group, because I haven't had a chance to get connected with them today on okay. these comments. So okay. um, if you Great. don't mind. If we yeah. So Stephen, I see your hands up and then, you know, the work group members, um, please feel free to share more about your thoughts about this rollout um, time frame in particular. So Jessica, I had a clar clarification question that might help with the conversation, because I think so, because my members are affected by this, obviously, when it comes to, you know, roofs or tenant improvement projects and all of that. When you're recycling C and D, do each of those materials require their own container? And so, and the reason why I asked that is to the point that you were discussing as to what is actually acceptable to be put into the marketplace on the, the, the back end, right? After the haulers have picked it up. If there's, you know, it requires space for all of those containers. And so that's kind of where I'm just wondering is, is it, because to me, it'd be have to, that's where those complications start coming in is, do we know in advance so that then they say, they say, well, right now we know the market's only there for concrete and asphalt. And I'm going to say clean wood, cause I don't know any better, but so then that's what they have to make sure they're doing. I just kind of want to make sure that we don't go down this path of the end market is so complicated on this, that it could change on a dime. And how do we account for that? And so to your point, how do we, you know, that might take some time to figure out what that looks like. I don't know the answer to that. Well, we wanted to move the list of required materials into the rules and regulations so that we have at least some control over, over the, you know, what is going to be recyclable. Um, and because understanding that, you know, that could, that does change. Um, but yes, so at a job site, the idea is we don't have a facility like a regular recycling facility for the residential stream that takes it all mixed together and sorts it out. We don't have that for C&D in the Denver area. And so um, you would need to separate it on site in order to recycle those materials. Does that answer your question? It does. And I think that that becomes somewhat of that challenge when you're talking about existing buildings is the space for all of those containers and how do they manage that um, from a permitting standpoint. And I think that that's the part that the city is gonna have to understand because now are they taking up the extra st street space? So there's parking spaces that have gone away and all that. I think that this one, to the, th this is where the it's gonna be like the events. There's all these things that are kind of that unknown that I feel like the city, in my mind, it's the city is gonna need to have time to understand how to make this work in a way that doesn't cause so much frustration, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That And so that's just why I kind of wanted to put that out there is I feel like that that's kind of 
Mm -hmm. those unknowns in my mind. And if I'm wrong, I mean, obviously I I'm, I'm willing to admit that, that I'm wrong, but I feel like that that's. We've, we've certainly talked about that a lot in our working group. And and we've also seen a lot of examples of where cities have been successful in that space. So, yeah. Definitely. I can probably add in. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Lori, go ahead. So, so I'm actually sitting in can. I just saw a comment in the chat about shingles. They're not recyclable in um, even by rule in Colorado right now. I'm in Kansas City at a asphalt paving conference <laughs> talking about using recycled shingles and asphalt and shingle to shingle. So, um, so Stephen, good point, right? We know even with just multifamily recycling, there's no space for containers. But unlike recycling MRFs, we don't have that yet for CND construction and demolition. So you can't put it all in one container. So our work group. Um, six years, that even still gives me a little bit of quivers um, to get these markets online for the stuff to like have a place to go. <laughs> um, and so this ties in though, now we have the Circular Economy Development Center, which we're running and it's a five-year run and we're trying to stand up three new markets and, and expand through existing. But even if we did that, if we do three new markets, two of which are, are slated for C&D in five years, that's an astronomical feat. So um so I think I mean I think that that addresses the the six year rollout. <laughs> Probably ten would be more realistic um, for it to be reasonable. Um, but then also the front range waste diversion board is in terms of strategy. If you, if you need us on that board as well, look in is we're trying to address stuff like this, right? Like big big infrastructure needs that we have not just in Denver but all the surrounding greater metro area. So maybe that's helpful. But until we get C and D MRFs online, um, the market's going to be really tough. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. And Ryan, I just wanted to, so Jason Bryant, just so you know, he's one of the BOMA members and he's actually works for a construction company. So I just wanted you to know who he was. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Jason, I see your hands up. I, If it's okay, what I would love to do is hear from task force members first, especially those of you on the work group, so you can respond and address some of these points that have been raised, because I know you all have discussed them extensively. Thank you, Lori. Um, so let's, Anna, I see your hands up and then we'll go to if there are others of you have been involved in these conversations and then Jason, definitely interested in your, your thought here too. Um, thank you, Jason, the items you listed aren't, um, you're not able to recycle those. So if items aren't recyclable, you, they would be trash items. Um, I was going to just respond to Steven. So yeah, space is always going to be something that you have to figure out your, in most job sites, you're not going to be able to, in residential job sites, have three bins out in the street. So what happens um, usually is you have one landfill dumpster, and then you have to stage items like scrap metal or wood recycle on the job site, and then do a drive-by that day. Everybody loads that material. On we certainly do have residential job sites where there's enough yard space where we can have more than one roll-off but you have to get creative. Um, so I think it's always gonna be something we have to take a case by case basis. Um, I'd say on a lot of, depending on commercial jobs, there could be more space. Um, it really depends on, on the job site, but I would imagine that um, you know your typical residential job, you're probably not gonna see three roll offs there for scrap metal, wood, landfill, or even like a concrete one. It's more your, loading it that day that you're removing that specific item and kind of keeping keeping those bins rotating and moving. So thank you, Anna. I, so, cause I was, I was more, BOMA doesn't do any residential, but the, you know, I'm thinking of a downtown commercial building, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't, there's not that space either, I don't think to collect. So I just, anyway, I just think the point is, my point was, is that this one's going to be extremely complicated, even if there has to be three bends or two bends sometimes is, you know, and, and how can they regularly get trucks down there to empty them and, and all of that kind of thing. I think my point I'm trying to make, I think, is I, I feel like that Lori kind of was making it too, is that the longer rollout on this one is going to be needed because there's too many variables there. And to be quite frank, you know, the office market currently is in such distress that, you know, additional costs, I mean, to, for TIs have already gone up. And so I just have concern that it's going to cause a lot of frustration, um, extra costs and things like that when we don't exactly know. And so I would hate for someone to be, you know, 
having to try to find the extra space for for all of these extra bins and then find out down the road that they didn't necessarily need it or whatever so yeah yeah, and how, Stephen, just real quick to respond to that. So on projects that we've done, like downtown on the Wells Fargo building, or we're working on restaurants down by Cherry Creek Mall, um, space is absolutely an issue. And it's, um, we have to have a good plan. And generally with commercial projects, we're not working during the day anyways. It's early in the morning before other tenants are in the space or it's after. And so we're using all the resources we have to use, you know, get a parking spot where we can stage all the doors and then those go away. So again, it's, it's, it's an issue. We, we get creative and then use that different timing to figure it out case by case. Thank you. Um, so Chris, I see your hand up and then just a note that we have about 10 minutes left on this recommendation. I would love, you know, if, if somebody does want to make a proposed tweak that you do that. And otherwise, hopefully this conversation helps um, generate some support for how this is and clarity, why it's written the way it is now. But anyway, yes, Chris, go ahead. Appreciate the clarification on what we are making recommendations on. So thank you for everything today. Um, but I would ask that when we talk about making recommendations that we consider places where we might recognize uh, weaknesses in infrastructure or capacity and might make recommendations that the city consider exploring alternatives or even stepping into that. Uh, Anna was great in giving us the tour of the deconstruction property a couple of weeks back and thank you for that. Uh, but what it truly showed was that there is some capacity needs around the processing of this material. It sounds like there's some needs around storage as well. And that might be a place that we could make a recommendation at the city look at or explore through its waste management facilities, uh, what would be needed for it to stand up some of these services when it comes to processing these materials. And whether it's denailing, which is an expensive piece of equipment being done at the municipal level, or again, something as simple as storage space, uh, I think it would be important that the city recognize that we just can't make these recommendations and think we got it. The city also needs to look at what the future of standing up these type of markets could look like. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So that goes to, you know, if there are other recommendations that could accompany the suggested ordinance changes or uh, language for the rules and regs. Um, Josh, Jackson, I see your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, the shingles were on the list of materials um, that could not be recycled. Someone want to respond to that? Yes, they're 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 deemed non-recyclable. I'm actually working on a big shingle to shingle project now, um, and we're working at CDPHE. And the reason behind that is because we got ginormous shingle mountains here um, that the state had to incur the cost to mitigate to clean up. And so they deem them non-recyclable. And there's a lot more history with that. And I'm happy to share it with anybody. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Circular Colorado, you guys can just reach out to us and we can explain it to you. Thanks. The, reason I'm, the reason I'm asking that question is because there is already a shingle um, recycling center that was closed down previously. <clears throat> and if that, cent if that center were to be re reopened, um, that, that could be financed through the permitting process itself to help keep it open. Um, and there are other materials that are on that list of unrecyclables that may be able to be added to the recyclable list um, if that facility were to be back opened. Well, that's just a grinding facility and processing. The, the shingles have to have somewhere to go. And when they don't have somewhere to go, that's how they build up. And then we don't need a rabbit hole into that. But shingles is a really ginormous issue. Um, I can give you more information on it. but. So it's not just about opening facilities to grind them. It's about where the shingles are going to go. You have a whole entire market. You have a whole entire secondary market um, just with just with the streets alone. Just with three percent RAS. So so if you want to reach out to me, I can. Like I said, I'm sitting here at the National Asphalt Pavers Association. Well, and, 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 and they don't like yeah. to even put shingles in roads. So there's all these things, right, Ryan? It's there's so much backstory to it and so much policy and 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 spec and spec guidelines for paving and all kinds of things that well, are important. and and I totally encourage those of you on the task force to reach out to each other if you have you know questions or thoughts and have a way to just think creatively with each other if there are things that can be added even to the you know add-on policy recommendations that could come out of this. So feel free to talk separately amongst yourselves on these on these specific topics for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Josh and Lori. Uh, Ian, I saw your hand go up too. 
Yeah, I think the petitioners would like to make a recommendation to move to a higher volume in the first years um, and then tailor off as more products become available through the rules and regs. You know, when you look at the city's climate plan and you look at the amount of emissions that are directly related to construction waste, this is one of the largest pieces that we need to take on as a city beyond the equity of giving one, everyone access to recycling and composting. And so for us, we'd like to see a larger volume early on and then have it phase in from there. Um, you know, I didn't have a chance to sit on this working group. I've worked on a construction site um, as an electrical apprentice, but other than that, I mean, I, I'd love to hear people's reaction to that because I think we would like to see uh, it move faster because of the impacts to the overall goals of the city. And so um, I, again, just because, okay, so that's a proposal. I, we have like three minutes that we've allocated to finish up this conversation on CD. And I really would love to turn to the work group members who presumably batted that around. I assume you all did. And I'm wondering if you wanna just talk about how that was, how that discussion went down in your group and whether you all would support that change. Go ahead. I'll, I'll go and maybe right. and then we'll follow. Right. Yeah, again, it's just, Ian, we'd all love to do it. We'd all love to jump to 100, especially seeing these 30 plus percent of what's going to landfill, but the markets aren't there. They just aren't there. And CND, unlike single stream aluminums, plastics, there's nowhere to ship that stuff to. It's too heavy. So you're not going to take shingles and go ship it out of state. You're not going to go take, you know, and asphalt concrete is recyclable locally. And so we know we can do that. Um, but so many of these are drywall. It's another big thing I work on, right? Demo drywall. It could have asbestos. It could have lead. It has coatings. I mean, it just goes on and on and on as to why those markets aren't here today. They're in development, but there's no way they're going to happen in the next 12, 24, 36 months to come to full fruition, if that makes sense. Thanks, Lori. Anna, um, go ahead. And then Brian. Ian, um, so I was a big proponent of a phased approach for long-term success um, because I've watched other cities like Palo Alto um, rush to too much of an ordinance too fast without properly educating or having the end markets. And so I, I'm like so on board with this entire thing. That's why I started my company. Um, and I know that there's so much more education and awareness that needs to happen with, among all the contractors. So this feels like um, an achievable goal that we can get people to with the 50% based on end markets from what Lori's saying. Um, and it, I really was a proponent for this because of for the long-term success in making sure that we don't rush to something that doesn't mean anything, nobody complies, and then we don't actually get uh, any positive movement forward. Okay, thank and you. Yeah, and Jessica, go ahead, and then we'll go to just, Brian. Just to add one more thing on the working group's uh, behalf. So another thing about this, about the C and D section as a whole, is that another recommendation is part of the compliance recommendation was that, you know, you also have to have a minimum of three different types of materials recycled, with you know, and reaching fifty percent at a minimum in the first year. So, you know. It's likely that if if fifty percent of the site is really concrete and asphalt, that they're going to have to try harder to get the three material minimum. So we're already so we because we still wanted to push people in the right direction, right? We want to kind of bring that awareness and education, and you know just not have people meeting the minimum because asphalt and concrete's easy, so easy quote unquote. So uh, I just wanted to make that known because it's not really part of the phasing conversation, but it is part of the compliance recommendation and it does help, um, you know, drive more diversion actually. Okay, thank you all. And I, I, it's helpful to hear what you all have been, how you've been tackling on this, the work group, because I know you've been trying to figure out the biggest bang for the buck and how to maximize waste diversion as quickly as possible on the C&D. Um, Brian. Let's go to you and then we'll try Can to wrap go up. back uh, to the slide with the timelines on it. The one with the timelines for the first year before. There we go, right there. Oh, um, no, not the not the diversion percentages. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So I think, I think where uh, the proponent question is, it seems to me the calculation here puts the eighty percent diversion 
of recyclable materials to happening after the 20 into 2031. And the idea of having the ordinance recommendations of the timeline. So if it's years one, one and two is 50 percent, year uh, three and four, 60, you know, three, three, four, whatever. But not after year five, but by year five, we're moving to that 80 percent diversion of recyclable materials. OK, thanks for the clarification. And Jessica, do you want to respond to that? I saw you nodding your head there. I, I was just under, I was nodding as I understand. Thanks. For yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, well, in terms of, I think because we want to, if we're going to make it, any changes to this, um, we want to make sure it's going to be something that people can broadly support or live with on the task force. I'm not sure if I'm hearing that, but I'm also wondering if what Brian and Ian raised is, is a clarification as well as, or even more than a, a material change or no. I'll, I'll let you all, Jessica and Anna and others on the, Lori on the work group. Yeah, I'd respond. like to hear what the, like the working group thinks about it um, after year five versus by year five. Anna, I see you put a note in the chat and maybe can you just verbalize what? Sure. So the way we thought about this was everything that goes to the landfill in year one, 50% must be diverted from the landfill by weight. And then in years four to five, 65% must be diverted from the landfill. When you, on the residential side, when you take down a house, about 50% of the house by weight is concrete. So we're, we're asking because we know the end markets for concrete is available now that that's achievable. So then by years four through five, we upped it to 65% because we believe that wood and organic end markets, either for wood recycle that becomes mulch or wood that can then be reused would be able to be diverted. Metal is also included with that 50% and 65%. We're expecting those items to be um, recovered along with, um, well, I guess I, I can't remember if we ended up pulling out cabinets and appliances, um, but hopefully those are getting diverted as well. And then by 80, by year five, we're expecting 80% of everything that gets removed from a job site would be diverted from the landfill. So all the concrete would be recycled. That would include wood that can be removed for recycle or reuse or scrap metal and so, then and all donation salvageable items so is that saying and part, i wasn't part of these discussions but then are you all saying for that third bullet that starting at year five meaning by year five mm -hmm. they, you need to start you need to be diverting 80 percent. so it's mm -hmm. about so i think i'm hearing that it may need a little clarification yeah that it means right that it means by year five this at year five this is going to start to be required and and it's you know it's a big lift right if instead of demoing a giant commercial building to get to 80 percent diversion on a giant commercial building you're gonna have to take it apart and so um we want to make sure that that those groups are ready to take that full commercial building apart by by year five or after year five, um, but that was the intent in stretching that out. So, so I guess with the benefit of that discussion, um, well, I'm, I'm, I was just a, about to say something, but then Margaret, I saw your comment. And do you wanna just make this verbally? Um, because I do think we're in the process of trying to put this one to bed and you might have a useful suggestion. Sure, yeah, it just seems to me like, all of this, like there's no end market for this and there's no end market for this. So we need like 20% that's not diverted. It's like, why don't we just make it that everything that's recyclable should be diverted? Um, maybe maybe with those phases still of 50% to 80%, but that you have exempt materials like shingles so that people aren't trying to find an end market for something that doesn't exist. 
Right. And so maybe that does go to the definition of readily recyclable, which I know you all addressed, Jessica. Well, we we definitely all agree that we should keep the list of, of what is expected to be recycled in the rules and regulations. So it's it's not necessarily about listing everything that's not recyclable, but just like the you know, the minimum um asphalt, concrete, bricks, metal, clean wood. Um, I feel like I'm missing one, you know, like those are the ones that we're expecting. And then everything else we understand there is in the market for it. That's why it's not going to be in our list. So Steven, it's not the other way around. Do you want to so, add a clause to that? Yeah. Well, I, I just, maybe this would help clarify. So Jessica, the rules and regs, is that something, so coming from the nonprofit world, I'm trying to relate it to, to what I understand. So our bylaws cannot be changed except by a vote for our members. So an ordinance can't be changed, but our policies can be changed when they need to be based on the time and or changes and whatever might be going on. So can the rules and regs be changed easier if something happened down the road with your list of recyclable things to where yeah. that kind of would, that maybe helps them see everybody see that you're putting stuff in rules and regs that has a little bit more flexibility to be changed by Dottie if they needed to because the mar in market changed versus the ordinance itself. Does that kind of help clarify maybe some of the stuff that we're talking through? Yes, that does clarify it. Thanks. That's that is true. Okay. So I okay, Clinton, you might have the last word here because I saw your hand go up and then I want <laughs> to see if I'm hearing correctly. And then we're gonna actually, I think Grace um and Blake, you're gonna screen share any sort of the current state of play with respect to the recommendations that are in draft form out there. Um, so Glenton, go ahead. I just wanted to ask a quick question to Jessica or Anna, because I was on the beginning of that work group and then had to pull off, but did soil, clean soil get removed as one of the items to be recycled? I don't think that was ever one so, of the items. So according to the EPA, soils are not construction waste. And so oh. we are using the EPA's uh, definition of construction waste. Thanks, okay. Chris. Right, and hazardous Thanks, hazardous soils are their own category. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so I definitely I heard a potential um, suggestion floated out there. It sounds to me like from the discussion that you all have had as a work group, you've talked sounds like at length about that possibility and have arrived where you've arrived for the reasons you articulated. It sounds to me like that's not, there isn't a widespread groundswell to change this proposal at this point. So that's what I'm hearing. Um, but I would really, I think, turn it to you all, Grace um, and Blake and city staff to just reflect what you think you've heard at this point, see if people are okay enough to live with what we've got for recommendations based on this conversation for purposes of sending this out for public comment, which I think sure. is going to require so, great Blake to maybe stop screen sharing. Maybe, and maybe Blake and I'll tag team this and maybe Anna too. So of all the materials that you all received, all the links you received, there was one that was a summary document where we had these like single paragraphs that described uh, what each recommendation is. We've been taking notes in that document um, on these conversations, sort of like margin comments. And so I don't know if we're, I mean, I guess we're we're supposed to share that right now. Ryan, is that right? Well, um, you I think if you if if there were edits or suggestions that you clearly heard that you're in a place to be able to share coherently now, that would ha be helpful. I think that's that would be great. That would be ideal. I think that no okay, that I'm, I'll speak to one and then I'll turn it over to Blake to, or Jessica to see if they have anything yeah. else to say about C and D. The one that I, big takeaway that I have on special events is that when we share these out for public comment in this paragraph form, however we share it in on our website. Um, however, we make it available to the public when we speak about it in presentations, we need to we need to articulate the the discuss, discussion we had today. This whole concept of the pros and cons of small events going first versus large events going first, and describe mm -hmm. all the issues around that. So that especially when we're having discussions, you know, in person um, at focus groups or when people are simply reading it, they can have all that context in their minds when they're providing feedback. That was, that was my main takeaway that I wrote down for the special events piece. Excellent. 
I think that's really helpful. Thank you. And I, and I see you put a comment to that effect in the margins. And yeah. just to reiterate to people what you're seeing, um, I mean, Grace said this, but I'm just going to restate it because I think it's important. So this document is like an executive summary of what the recommendation, the draft recommendations say at this point. It captures what you've just seen in the slides. So there's nothing new here. Um, but it's going to be what's posted in, it's going to be posted on the website in some fashion. So people will be able to see each of these recommendations in narrative form. And there may be some comments that are maintained on the, on the side to like what Grace said. It shouldn't be super hard. It shouldn't be super messy and hard to read for the public, but it may be, right. There may be one or two yeah. comments per section that, that really help direct people to how, how, how you want them to think about it. So, um, that's that's really helpful. Thank you, Grace, for in terms of special events. I don't know if there's others, if sort of comparable takeaways that others of you have had from in terms of city staff who've been helping. I, with I can offer one more because um, there really for the com, for the compliance timelines for residential non residential. I didn't really I didn't hear any issues with the timelines. It was a, more of a concern of really enforcement. And so we might need to either, again, in the description of these for the public, we might not eat, we might either need to reference the enforcement section or more likely put a note here that says, or that indicates that our enforcement process would provide opportunities for the regulated entities to present uh, a rationale for why they were not able to comply if they were making a good faith effort. Mm -hmm. um, and so that there may be a like a circular reference there on that one. Great. So it's clear that, right, the focus is good faith efforts and there's going to be lots of need for exemptions or waivers or whatever they're going to be called in the rulemaking. Um, okay, and what about other any other takeaways in terms of the conversation we just had about c and I mean, and I, I know this is putting everyone on the spot because it's a complicated discussion to try to summarize on the fly. It... It definitely seems like to me there's just an inherent balance in the scene in the construction demolition conversation about maximizing waste diversion and sort of getting the biggest bang for your buck and realities of where the market is and being responsive to that. Um, that is just an inherent tension in all of this. But anything else that anyone from the work group wants to call out as a big takeaway from this discussion? Well, I feel like to address. Brian and Ian's concerns that, that Blake put in the chat some clear dates, you know, by January 1, 25, 50% by January 1, 28, 65 by January 1, 20, yes, 30, 80%. Um, to kind of make it more clean that by 2030 we're at 80%. Yes. Um, and so I think I think my group is comfortable with that. And you guys certainly speak up if if you're not. Um Yep. It's just a little bit different than the original proposal, I think. Yep. Thank you, Jessica and Anna. Go ahead. I was just going to mention part of the conversation around trying to make sure this was successful and impactful was um, other communities that have just had a recycle what you can, everything that you can do it. We've seen that fail time and time again. And the, essentially, there's no it's there's just no accountability. So having this percentage of what of everything that's going um, really creates like a, a clear metric and something that we can measure and make sure that's actually happening. Um, because these communities that just have like a recycling mandate, it it doesn't. There's no actual impact. That's great. And I know that when Blake has talked about lessons from other jurisdictions, it's been really helpful to the task force. My guess is it would be important for members of the public to know that you, you know, there's been some looking at lessons learned and other examples and learning from those in the course of developing these. Okay. So hopefully um, if, if somebody from the city would be willing to put this link um, or Makaya, this, the link to this, document in the chat so people can tell us no it's not ready okay so task force task force members just know that this is in your email you have this link and i think we you have a link it. 
and it's in your shared folders as well. So it's there, you can look at it. It's, you know, the edits will be updated by the end of this meeting and in an ongoing way before public comment. And um, that's where you'll find this. But at this point, I'm wondering, it's, I, I, I'm hoping that people are comfortable after this conversation with this general set of pack, this general package of recommendations in con conceptual draft form going out for public comment to see what people have to say about them. Is there anyone who is uncomfortable, like fundamentally uncomfortable with that at this point? Just wanna make sure we hear from you. Anyone on the task force? Knowing that members of the public definitely are gonna need and, and have a chance to provide their own comments on this. Okay, I'm guessing that that means, it sounds like that means that people are comfortable enough with these draft recommendations to let them out for public outreach, for the public outreach process, um, which I really, really appreciate because I know there are strong feelings about this. A lot of you have a really large stake and that's why you've, you're here and have devoted a lot of time and thought and some of you heart and soul to this. So anyway, I appreciate it. Um, okay, final. Final comment, staff, Blake, Grace, work group leads before we proceed. Now, I just want to just, again, thank everybody, as always, for, for donating your time to helping us figure this out as a community. And um, from a professional level, I, I truly believe we're on track to having the best ordinance that is out there. And because we're looking, we're having such ro robust discussions, we're doing the due diligence, we're looking at best practices elsewhere. Um, I, I truly believe that we're moving in the right direction and just hopefully others feel that 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 way as well. Um, and uh, look forward to engaging with the broader public in the in the month ahead. So thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you. We are going to um, pivot in our last half an hour to what happens next. And we've talked a lot about this idea of, you know, sending this out to public uh, comment and doing public outreach, but we want to talk more um, in more detail about what that's about. And Grace, I'm going to turn to you for that. Correct? And great, uh, Blake, yeah, I, think I think we need to bring the PowerPoint back up. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could start talking. <laughs> August public input. Okay. So Grace, maybe you can talk about what between now and August, like. Yeah, yeah that was it. Uh, the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so um, you know that we've set aside the month of August to do public outreach on this, and that's going to take on a number of different forms. So on this first slide, I'm going to describe what we city staff are doing, and the next slide, we'll talk about what we hope you will do as well. So as city staff, we are already working to organize focus groups with different uh, representative groups. So for example, in our office, we have um, a couple of staff people who specialize in uh, outreach to Spanish speaking populations, uh, business owners, as well as residents. So we met with them just the other day to get that going. They are helping us to um, plan and organize those, those focus group events, specifically uh, for residents, Spanish speaking re residents of um, multifamily units, un multi large multifamily buildings, um, and again, also business owners. We also have our Certifiably Green Denver program, which has a lot of connections with small businesses. We're going to be working with them. And we also have uh, great connections with RNOs and other community-based organizations. So we'll be reaching out to them as well. And of course, as um, Rose already mentioned, she's going to be getting to, gathering together a group of uh, special event uh, managers in addition to the folks who are already on the task force. So there, there are connections that we already have and that we're going to be using to have these small focused discussions um, with them. We will utilize our social media, do press release, and of course, we, we've got a great com communications team between all of our agencies. Uh, we'll try to get some earned media to direct folks to the draft recommendations. We will host uh, information on our website. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. I really like the um, Google form survey that Erica created. It's actually a really great way to record um, to record not only the feedback, but to make it easy for people to know which recommendation they're, they're commenting on. We're going to take a look at that as well as the city's own uh, tools that we have on our, on our own website 
just to try to make it as easy as we can for the public to leave their comments. Um, and then we also will host at least one, one public meeting. It's really more of a webinar, right? Where we give a presentation um, that could be for any audience, and then that will be recorded and posted to our website as well. So we're gonna do a lot of different things on our end to try to get the word out. And so direct people to provide comment. And go to the next slide, please. Okay, next is for you. We um, put this in one of our last emails. We would really, you know, you are all here not only representing yourselves, but you also represent different constituencies um, that have an interest in this ordinance. And we would like to lean on you to do what you can to uh, provide opportunities either for yourself to present and have discussions with the constituents that you represent and or have us do that with you. So I wanna give um, compliments to a couple of the colleagues who have already uh, started working on that. So Stephen from BOMA has already set up a meeting. Uh, Peggy with the Apartment Association has already set one up for us as well. And then Anna put a whole bunch of uh, suggestions about outreach for um, C&D and other organizations into our outreach uh, document as well. So thank you to all of you who participated in that. Uh, don't feel intimidated by this. We will be there to help you to the extent that you want us to help. So in some cases, you may want to run this conversation on your own and then provide us the notes afterwards. In other cases, you might want to make the introduction and have us uh, take the lead from there. You've seen there's a lot of city staff here. We're going to cover this to the greatest extent that we can. Um, it is only a month. There are, you know, only as much, there's only so many events that we can all do, but as Jessica can attest to, uh, and Nina as well, we did a lot of outreach during the um, expansion of waste services uh, run up before that went to city council. We did a lot of meetings. And so this is, we're city government. That's one of the things we do best is we have public meetings. So um, we'll provide you with text for you to do email outreach. If you wanna give the presentation yourself, we'll provide you with PowerPoint once we put that together. And again, like I said, we'll, we'll do our best to be with you if that's something that you want. And I don't know if you want to, is it time for the next slide? Maybe you stop there and get, let's stop there and see if yeah, we have and I think, this one. You know what I would recommend? Could we take a moment just to, um, it, it doesn't make sense to pause, stop screen sharing, and we can pull up the actual document. I could share my screen, but we could pull up the actual spreadsheet. Um, or is, do you want, not want to take the time to do that, Grace? Um, no, I mean, we can, it's just an Excel sheet right now. I think the main, the main thing yeah. is just for all of you to, to know, you know, where to put your names and what the city is going to fill out. And anyway, I think you can probably figure that out. Does yeah. anyone need us to screen share it? Would that be helpful? Any task force members? Okay. Looks like people are good. The idea is that we just want people to to, the city really would like you to sign up for it in the next couple of days so they can start scheduling these things with you and putting it on their calendars as well. Right. And, you know, let's be clear, like we're not going to get, we're not going to get a yes from everybody that we reach out to. So it's okay to put more um, contacts on there than we can possibly hope to actually present to, but that's okay. We, you know, we want to make sure that we do our best to reach all the different um, constituencies that have an interest in this, which I'm pretty sure is everybody in the city of Denver. And I, I, I guess I'll just say, I, I've been privy to a couple of emails back and forth. There are going to be some of you who, who might just want to do this for purposes of educating your constituents and members or networks, just for the sake of getting out the word about Waste No More. So it doesn't necessarily even need to be done with people who are going to have a ton to say or a lot of concerns or whatever, it could just simply be an opportunity to start getting the word out to ensure that people know that this is coming and that it's here, not just coming, but here. Okay, then I think we can go to the next slide to talk about then what happens after that. So in theory, uh, on August 31st, when we're done with public comment, we, the city, will have, we will have all the comments. We will have, whether it's um, downloaded from our website, whether it's in a survey like what Erica put together, plus we will have notes that we took and that you took from actual public meetings. We're going to put all of that together and we will summarize all of the comments that came in per each recommendation. Uh, when we do that, and I think frankly, having been through this before, we will get a sense throughout the month of how the comments are going. We will be able to flag and highlight 
where the the key points are that like, oh, this recommendation has a lot of suggestions going a different direction. We'll, just like we did in today's meeting, we will be able to focus in on those that really need more attention at our September meeting. Um, right As I was writing this slide, I immediately realized September 7th is undoubtedly too soon for this to happen because there's the end of, Oct end of August, then it's Labor Day, this is only two days later. And so I'm suggesting that where it says in red there, staff suggests, it's Grace suggests, and I think everyone agrees on my side. Um, I would suggest that we try to move this meeting to September 14th. And the reason for that is we can make the summary pretty quickly, but then you have to absorb it, right? We have to send it to you, you need to read it. And this is where, since we had some good feedback about the pre-meeting um, briefing that we did this past month, we could do that again. Um, where we can do a present, we can record a presentation, summarize what we heard, focus in on the recommendations that seem to have the most, you know, need for attention, get that out to you in advance of the meeting, and then come together and ideally on September 14th and have another discussion just like this today, um, where ideally we would come out with, um, again, a consensus of, okay, this is, this is where we want these recommendations to go. And then if we're able to do that, that's when you give us staff the order to go start drafting the revised ordinance. Um, we would do that, uh, it, as it says here, and as we've said to you many times, it will come back to you before it goes to city council. Um, there's a whole process that, that the city goes through. We have a number of internal reviews um, in the city. My belief is that while we're running that, we can concurrently at, this, or at the same time, we can bring it to you so that there's all the different um, entities that need to weigh in. We'll be doing that at the same time. Then we bring all those comments together. Then it heads to council. So I think right now the focus is, let's think about this September timeline um, and when, if you guys are agreeable to potentially moving the meeting to the 14th instead of the 7th. Well, and it's Labor Day too, so that adds into that time. Well, that's what I mean. It's like the fit, yeah. Well, yeah. The, right, it's the week out of Labor Day, I guess. Chris? Go ahead. Thank you. I hate to bring it up, but I just want to know what we're doing as far as a plan mm -hmm. in case there's any turnover of any uh, city support or any city staffers with the new administration coming in. That's a great question. I mean, and I, I can only answer so much in this public forum, but I am the only person that you're working with right now that is an appointee. And so I am the only person who's at least potentially likely at risk and that's and we're okay we've got it this is one of the great things about the city group that you have here is we have so many agencies represented and all the folks who are here are our staff not appointees it's not a guarantee that they're not you know that they're always going to be here but i think you've got a good strong group um there is there is always a possibility chris that our new mayor may decide that somehow this isn't a priority i just don't get that sense from him um, and I think the city council, the new members, and maybe Councilman Hines can speak to this, but I think that they're they're aware of this. They're eager to see this come to fruition as well. Um, so I think that I think that we'll still be charging full speed ahead. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thanks for leaning in. Sorry, it's you. I thought it was Ryan. Oh, oh, Ryan is our consultant. So she. I know. I'm kidding. Lives. Now I'm just having fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he knows. He knows. Um, so knowing that, you know, you all have had these uh, task force meetings on your calendar for a long time because Grace sent them out, you know, even before the group started meeting. So hopefully September 14th means that it, holding it that day means that you can either attend or send a proxy. And the proxy would obviously be someone who would need to be pretty well versed um, because, you know, there's been a lot of discussion so far. So Sonia, I already saw that you, you, would have someone that you would need to send instead, which is great if that works for you, which it looks like it does. Um, so I think, Grace, would you ask then that everyone hold that two to five on September, Thursday, September 14th on their calendars for now, and you all will be changing that? Certainly, we could actually just, I can just revise the invite that I have right now and just send it out for that date. And then we'll see if everybody could actually, you know, uh, you know how you respond by clicking like yes or, or decline. If you can actually do that and send the response, then I'll see on my end what the tracking is. Um, and then of course, just send me an email if you like absolutely can't do it and we'll get it, we'll get a sense of the numbers from that. And just if, just a little plug, if you do have a proxy that is going to attend instead and you decline it, please do send an email to 
maybe Grace and copy me, letting us know who's going to be there in your place, what their email is, so we can make sure to give them permissions to also see the task force documents for that meeting. Um, Cause I know that gets frustrating otherwise, yeah. and we can make sure they're invited. And I would say we'll do everything in our power to make sure that we're in person next time. Yes. I know the city tried really hard to make this tonight's meeting happen in person also. Um, okay. Any other, any questions about how the, how you all as a task force are going to go about seeing what the public comments have been seeing how city staff are proposing at least as a initial proposal to address them. Um, some may be, yes, we've discussed this extensively in work groups and the work groups and task force are weighing on the side of X. So we recommend not doing anything about this at this time. Um, some may be, yeah, we should have an edit to this recommendation or maybe we need an additional recommendation. So that, that kind of thing. Um, do any of you have questions about that process itself? Grace, thank you for laying out quite clearly. Okay, great, I don't see questions. Should we talk then about immediate next steps and any homework? Let's see, I think we have the next, the next and final slide. Yeah, and then it looks like we might be able to and early unless people have any final comments that they want to bring up, um, but go ahead. Grace, do you want to do this final next steps? Uh, I kind of thought that was you, but sure. I'm happy um, to. Yeah. Well, the, okay. so the final edit to the draft recommendations, that's the, that's the summary that we just went over. And so I don't, I don't know if we're really asking the task force now to make any changes to that document, are we really? I think that's up to you. I think that if you all, yep. Yeah, I think at this point we went through that summary. We have, unless unless you didn't hear something from us that we're that we need to do or that you want to reemphasize, I think we're done with that task. So the more important one, the one I'd like you all to focus on, is just engaging your make a plan for engaging your networks in August. Uh, use that spreadsheet to track that for us, and you know uh, we will follow up with information for you to give out to others. And then we will change this September 7th to September 14th date. Great. And okay, well, here we are. We're 15 minutes um, early, which is lovely because it's a summer Thursday. Um, but I think before closing, I just wanted to see if anyone had any, I love that we're seeing Chris at his bar. That is great. Um, does anyone else have any final comments? Questions? Okay. Looks like we're good. All right. Wait, you've got a, Brian has a hand up. Brian Luma. Yeah, you know, I, I apologize. And I know, you know, we had time set for each subject, but I'm just kind of still wondering and maybe just if I get a clarity answer on, I understand the timeline for the, deconstruction and and feel confident about that because the 2030 um and I, I just want to clarify like special events rose I, th I think you said something about being able to shortly start promoting uh that this measure is moving forward so businesses start or you know events start putting this in their agenda to start trying next year um is that is that like a, a full on like hey we're going to start doing that now? Yeah, we can work on a messaging campaign right now. It's great because I feel like at least we have a sense in the direction that the task force is going, and we can even begin that with our public outreach that starts um, August 9th as part of this programming. And we did do some messaging earlier in the year. Unfortunately, at that time we are we had more questions than we had answers. Um, so it's certainly not the first time we're pushing out this messaging, but we can certainly uh, continue those efforts. And, and yeah, I mean, generally speaking, when we roll out new policies, what we try to do is set people up for success. So, I mean, if there are, and we met with Becky early in the year in March, um, 
So if there's like resources, anything that we can do to try to set people up for success, we push that out heavily and then hope that they take it and run with it. Okay. And then the second, the second half of that, if I can real quick, yeah. was that, um, I apologize briefly, uh, was that 350 number. Is there some place where we are going to be able to reevaluate if that's the the right number for de minimis? Yeah. And so I'll invite you and Ian and, and whoever else, actually, I'll share it with this whole task force if they want to join um, the August 9th public outreach session that our agency is hosting for special events, um, particularly permitted events that permit with our office. So we'll take all the public comment at that time and then bring it back to this group and, and see if we need to revise that recommendation. Thank you. And Brian, and Brian, I think just in terms of this meeting and the and some of the takeaway notes that we're keeping, I think the discussion about special events, there was there was a strong push around, you know, not necessarily being hard on enforcement, being really hard on being really aggressive on education and doing everything possible um, as soon as possible. So I think that was duly noted and it was a it was a big takeaway from that conversation. Okay. Awesome. Others. Yeah, thank you. Final final comments, questions from others. Thanks for everyone's um, patience, including those of you who are not task force members. I know that um, we we ended up focusing just on task force member comments um, for all the reasons, and just really appreciate you all hanging in there with us. And definitely know that you will have lots of opportunity to ask questions and get get your comments in. Okay, well, I think we're ready to wrap up. Totally appreciate everyone coming off onto their videos to say goodbye and um, off mute if you want to. And it's just great to see everyone. Really appreciate everyone's dedication to this effort. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great, great.